announce, and the appearances are as before, uh, other than the jury is not in the room. And uh, it was reported to me that by Lieutenant Zerline that uh, this morning, Lieutenant Zerline, that this morning uh, at the pickup, uh, there was someone there and was video recording the jury, which uh, the officers approached the person and required him to, him, her, I didn't even ask, to um, delete the video and return the phone to him. Um, I've instructed that if it happens again there to take the phone and bring it here. So that's for your information. Um, number two, unless there's some request, I'm not going to address anything further about uh, our conversation of yesterday at the close and uh, later. And then, um, Is that person been showing up there for your honor? The person who was you know, I don't know the answer to that. You could talk to the lieutenant when okay. we get a chance. And then, um, I, uh, for the reasons stated in the brief which was filed by Mr. Kraus, the motion for reconsideration on count six is denied. All right, anything else? We were talking about exhibits that hadn't been moved that I think the parties are in agreement to. Okay. So, so uh, 64, 65, 66, 67, 76 and 77 um, are ones that are agreed upon. The only one that is not agreed upon at this point is 69, which is the statement, uh, the written statement by the officer regarding Gage Grosskreutz that we, that I had questioned him about yesterday. I had marked and I would move that and I think the state has an objection to that statement. All right. Um Mr. Mayor. Your Honor, the statement was used to impeach the witness. Um, I think some courts do things a little differently. I'm not, I don't recall off the top of my head. Sometimes those aren't marked as exhibits. Other times they're marked but not um, uh, admitted into evidence. Um, at the bottom line, Your Honor, is I don't think the jury should see it. So uh, as long as we don't show it to the jury, because I, it was only used for impeachment, I don't have any strong objection to how we handle it. Um, I think, generally speaking, things that are used for impeachment are not admitted to evidence. They may be marked as an exhibit, but not admitted to evidence. So that's that's where I'm at on that. Uh, did you want to say anything further? Uh, Judge, I, it was referred to. I wouldn't ask that it go back because the entire, at this point, the entire document had not been uh, read. But I think, based on the way it was used yesterday, it would be appropriate to make it part of the record. So uh, I'm going to uh, receive it for. Uh It'll be received into evidence, uh, but however, those portions which were not directly quoted in the uh, examination um, will not be argued, nor will they, because they, that part is not in evidence, and um, the exhibit will not go, certainly not in the, its original form, to the jury room. Okay. While we're cleaning up uh, exhibits, Your Honor, if I, if I may. Uh, exhibit number three, I think, has also been marked as exhibit number 57. That's uh, the Gross Courts live stream, and I double marked that by mistake. Um, but I would move both of those. They're identical uh, in evidence. Any objection on that? Any objection? Received. Yesterday, I also used exhibit 10, which is Ford Fisher News to Share. Um, I thought I had moved it. Uh, according to the court's list here, it's not uh, been admitted yet, so I would move that in. Objection? Nope. Received. We also used the Crime Lab Ballistics Report, Exhibit 23, with Heather Williams. So we move that into evidence. What was the number? 23. 23. Objection. Yeah, no, I have no objection. Received. That's, that's all we have right now. Thank you. All right. Ready to go then? Okay, I'm calling the jury. Hello. Would you come down, please? Yes.
Um, you're aware, of course, of the incident at the bus pickup this morning, and I've been assured that the officers uh, had the uh, the video which had been taken is de has been deleted, and new procedures are being instituted uh, so that something if something like that is uh, something like that sh should not recur. I'm frankly quite surprised that it did, uh, and. Um, that we have different procedures to do with respect to if it would occur. So I'm not, I, I, I don't have any particular concern about it. And we're very sensitive to this entire issue and uh, are, on, are on guard about it. Thank you. All right, Mr. Binger. Uh, Judge, uh, the state uh, will be calling James Armstrong to the stand. Mr. Armstrong, can you please uh, state your first name and spell it for the benefit of the court reporter? James Armstrong, J A M E S A R M A R M S T R O N G. And Mr. Armstrong, how are you employed? I'm a senior forensic imaging specialist with the Wisconsin State Crime Lab in Milwaukee. And what do you do as a forensic imaging specialist senior? We handle a variety of internal and external requests. Internally, we handle a lot of photography of evidence including fingerprints and footwear. Could you please slow down and start that sentence Sure. We handle, <clears throat> in the, uh, within the forensic imaging unit, we handle a variety of internal and external requests. This includes photographing fingerprints and footwear, along with uh, also doing forensic video analysis as well. What is forensic video analysis? It's so examination of video uh, pertaining to legal matters. And what is your educational background? I have a Bachelor's of Fine Art in Photography from Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. And uh, have you worked in photography or anything else in your past? Yes, uh, before coming to the crime lab, I worked in commercial photography for 14 years. Is your crime lab accredited? Our crime lab is cr accredited. And when you do some sort of forensic imaging, is there any kind of peer review process or anything that is done uh, to check your work? Yes, all the work that we do uh, within forensic imaging is tech reviewed by another qualified analyst and it's also administrative re reviewed as well. So when you're doing forensic imaging, does that include things like obtaining stills, zooming in, what kind of things do you do if you're uh, forensically looking at a piece of video? Yes, uh, it, it requires us to examine the video, uh, note any limitations of that video, and then provide any clarifications uh, of that video if requested. And have you been asked in this case uh, to look at any video or other uh, photography evidence? Yes, I've been requested to look at uh, different video uh, that's been submitted to the lab. I would ask that Exhibit 24 be put on the screens. Mr. Armstrong, I want to show you what has been previously marked as States Exhibit 24. Uh, you look at either screen, is, which other screen is more comfortable. Uh, does that look familiar to you? Yes, it does. And what is that? Those are three clarified images that I produced um, from the, I'm sorry, that I produced from item U, uh, from a video file that was submitted as item U. So a video, video file was submitted uh, by me and you found an image and you clarified it. That is correct. How do you go about doing that? I utilize uh, a variety of software. In this particular case, I used Ant5 to uh, enhance and clarify that image. Now, is it your job to figure out what is in the image, or are you just providing 
or attempting to provide more clear or uh, viewable images. In this particular case, the request was just to clarify uh, the item of interest in this video. If I could have uh, exhibit 25, please. Mr. Armstrong, I'm showing you what has previously been marked as States Exhibit 25. Uh, do you recognize that? Yes, this appears to be the video that I annotated uh, as part of a request. What do you mean by annotated? I added the square box and the labeling uh, to this video. And is it your job to actually say who is who in the video? Or are you just pointing out people of interest that you've been designated to you? I'm just pointing people, just pointing out people as designated. Um, and how did you go about making this exhibit? Uh, to make this exhibit, uh, we load the video file into M5, and then I essentially uh, draw on that individual uh, frames as it goes through, and then I'll put a video. Can we play exhibit 25, please? So you annotated it all throughout that portion of the video? That is correct, yes. Did you enhance or clarify or do anything else in the video or just simply annotate what was given to you as a raw video? I just simply annotated that video. Let's uh, show you what it marked and previously entered as States Exhibit 26. Objection. I'm asking for that. Well, this has already been entered. I, I heard it in it as States Exhibit 26, okay. 26. Mr. Armstrong, do you recognize this? Yes, I do. And what is this? This is another annotated video with an arrow. And did you create this video as well? I did, yes. Similar to the last video, did you simply annotate it? You didn't change anything about the video? That is correct, yes. Uh, I'd like you to please just briefly play Exhibit 26. Now, again, is that someone you've identified or someone that was designated to you to mark? That is someone that was designated uh, to me to mark. Mr. Armstrong, in this case, were you ever given a video and asked to get still shots of a snippet of a video? Yes, I was. And are you aware if that is the BG on the scene video, do you recall? I do not exactly recall um, with regards to that video, no. Uh, but fair to say that we asked you to look at a, a short segment and produce every still image that you could? Yes, that is correct. And were you able to do that of this video? Yes, that is correct. And do you know how many stills that you received from that video? 729 stills. And this morning before we came over here, did you view a folder that had those stills in the, uh, from the video? Uh, yes, I did. Um, at this part, I'd like to mark uh, and move a folder named Frames, uh, which is States Exhibit 80. Um, I'd like to uh, move that into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. If I could have the next uh, video exhibit, 81.
Mr. Armstrong, in addition to those uh, videos that you've already mentioned, have you recently done any more forensic imaging work in this case? Yes, I was provided another video file um, as item X. And what did you do with item X? With item X, I enhanced and uh, enlarged the video file and cropped it to the area of interest. I'd like to show you what is marked as States Exhibit 81. Do you recognize this? Yes, that appears to be the videos, uh, clarified video that I uh, exported. Now, did you have any difficulties clarifying or tracking this file? Uh, the, the limitations of this file include the movement of the camera, um, movement of the person, and the lighting conditions that are present. Now, you mentioned limitations. Did all these various videos you looked at have different limitations? Yes, each had their own set of limitations. Um, I'd like you to, is this, uh, I know we watched, did we watch this video this morning? I believe so, yes. And is it a true and accurate copy of the uh, exhibit that you created of that drone video? It appears to be so, yes. I'd like to move exhibit 81 into evidence and play it for the jury. No objection. Go ahead. If I could have exhibit 82, please. Mr. Armstrong, do you recognize this? Yes, I do. What is this? This is a video, again, clarified um, and cropped into the area of interest, and this video is slowed down by 50%. And is it a true and accurate copy of the video that uh, you've created for this exhibit? It appears to be, yes. Uh, please, uh, I'd like to move Exhibit 82 into evidence and publish it to the jury. No objection. Steve. Mr. Armstrong, did I give you a specific area to sort of focus in on in this video? Yes, you instructed that I look at the area near the sign, near some vehicles, and then as the uh, person uh, enters into the parking lot. Were you able to zoom in tight on that area? Not, not beyond what has been provided, no. Uh, can you go back to Exhibit 81? Mr. Armstrong, let's give you this pointer. And if you could stop, please, toward the beginning. If you could please point out, the state of, point out the area of interest that I asked you to focus in on. So behind that, there's a black vehicle there. It would be the, the rear of that black vehicle. Yes, that is correct. Can we play Exhibit 81 again? And Exhibit 82, please. Again, Mr. Armstrong, could you point out uh, the area of interest in this video that I asked you to uh, zoom in on? Again, it's to the rear of that black vehicle. I think we've been calling it the Duramax in this trial. Yes. Oh, the front of the vehicle, I apologize. But near that vehicle, the Duramax? Yes, that is correct. Uh, could you play exhibit 82, please?
Yeah, you may sit down. Thank you. Last year is marked as States Exhibit 83. Do you recognize this? Yes, it appears to be the video uh, that's been uh, clarified and then enlarged as well. And uh, is this a different part of that same drone video? Yes, this is a different uh, segment uh, picking up from the stopping point of the previous video and continuing on to where the video, uh, uh, the camera view turns away from the area of interest. Um, is a true and accurate copy of the exhibit that you created? It appears to be so, yes. Could you, uh, I'd like to move exhibit 83 into ev evidence and publish it to the jury? No, no objection, Your Honor. If I could uh, ask for exhibit 84, please. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, what is this? Uh, this is the same segment, uh, except it's slowed down by 50%. So everything else is the same, it's just slowed down by half? That is correct. Let's uh, move to exhibit 84. Did you say 50% or 60? Uh, 50%, Your Honor. Uh, Luther moves to be 84 in evidence and publishes to the jury. No. Received. Now, I'd like to ask for States Exhibit 85. And Mr. Armstrong, what is this? This is a, another clarified and enlarged video um, showing from approximately the 15 second mark until uh, the where the camera turns, turns away from the area of interest. And is it a true and accurate copy of the video that you produced for this exhibit? It appears to be so. I'd like to move exhibit 85 into evidence and uh, publish it to the jury. No objection. Proceed. Exhibit 86, please. Well, that's being pulled up, Mr. Armstrong. There was no sound in any of these videos, were there? I did not observe any sound with these videos, no. And if I could just direct your attention to number 86, do you recognize that? Uh, yes, that's the same as the previous file. Uh, the only difference being, again, is that it, it is slowed down by 50%. Uh, I'd like to move exhibit 86 into evidence and play it for the jury. No objection. Proceed.
Okay, uh, I have no further questions. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. The exhibits we, we've just shown the jury 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, and 86. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you began working on putting them together on Friday. I began working on them on Sunday. Okay. When did the crime lab receive them? The crime lab received that as a submittal on Sunday. Okay. And who submitted them to you? I was ADA Jim Cross. Okay. And you're familiar with the fact that we didn't receive these videos until Friday of last week? I was informed that that was the circumstance, yes. Okay. And when you do this, you're not adding color, correct? That is correct. I'm not adding color. You're not adding pixels. If with regards to enlargement, there is interpolation, and so pixels are added to that. Okay. How is the color's not changed? Color is not changed. So if you blow something up 10%, what does that do for the pixel number? The pixels will increase um, by interpolation of that of that um, area. Okay. And what was the resolution of the source video for 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, and is it 86? I would need to refer to my notes in order to be able to confirm that. Please do, sir. Resolution for that file, it was 1920 by 844. And in layman's terms, what is that? Uh, that's 1920 pixels by 844 pixels. Okay. And that's kind of tells you the clarity. The more pixels, the clearer it is. The more pixels, the higher resolution, there's more information present. Okay. And when, if you have to look at your notes, that's fine. Videos are done at certain speeds, so certain um, videos, whether it's a phone or whether it's a camera, they do it by frames per second. That is correct. The more frames per second, the clearer it is. Not necessarily, no. Okay. This one, how many frames per second, sir? This, fra uh, this video is 30 frames per second. Okay. 30. 30 or 30? 30. So every one second, 30 different frames. That is correct. And you can use how many frames go by to time certain things, correct? You can, yes. Okay. You can use different videos if you can find a common event, such as a sound, to sync up videos to tell a whole story, correct? That would be uh, starting to move outside my area of expertise with that. Okay. But you're familiar that it can be done, correct? I'm familiar that it can be done. Okay. And what is that called, if you know? I do not know. Okay. And you can take different videos from different source, sources, excuse me, linking them through a common event sometimes, sound, put them together for a whole compilation. Um, with regards to audio, that's outside the scope of my expertise. Okay. And you can also do it from events on the video if they have a common event, not audio, but a common event. Um, it depends on the video in, in question. Okay. And in this case, when you put the marks person of interest, who told you to do that? Uh, that was provided by the requester, ADA Jim Cross. Because you don't know anything about these videos when you get them or anything about the case. You're just told, we think this person's important. We want them followed. That is correct. Okay. And in your case, I think you used yellow arrow arrows? I did, yes. Okay. I have nothing further. Thank you. Any redirect? No, thank you. You may step down, sir. See if will Dr. Kelly do the scene.
Lift your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony about to give Miss Better be the truth, the whole truth, and that's but the truth to help you God? I do. You may be seated. Doctor, would you please state your name and spell them for the benefit of the court reporter? My name is Doug Kelly, D-O-U-G-K-E-L-L-E-Y. And are you a doctor? I am. And what kind of doctor are you? Uh, I'm a forensic pathologist. What is a forensic pathologist? Well, pathology is uh, the field of medicine that involves the study of disease and trauma in the human body. Uh, forensic pathology is a subspecialty of that which uh, specifically involves the principles of medicine and science as they apply to the law. So as a forensic pathologist, we're concerned with determining the cause and manner of death in people and uh, uh, typically we act as uh, medical examiners in medical examiner's offices. So we'll uh, look at those uh, issues in people who fall within our jurisdiction. And you, where do you work now? Uh, the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office. And are you aware that the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner does handle the forensic pathology for Kenosha County? That's correct. What is your educational background? I graduated from Illinois Wesleyan University in 1990, in 1988, sorry, and uh, then went to medical school at Southern Illinois University School of Medicine in Springfield, Illinois. I graduated in 1992. Um, I uh, was in internal medicine residency from uh, 1992 to 94 and decided to be a forensic pathologist. Uh, my forensic pathology training in pathology is uh, with St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, I completed that in 1998. Uh, I then came to Wisconsin and did my forensic pathology fellowship with the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office, completing that in uh, the summer of 1999 and then uh, stayed on as a staff member after that. And have you worked as a forensic pathologist or a associate medical examiner or something in that capacity since then? Yes, I have. Do you have an idea of how many autopsies you've performed? Uh, I'm at or a bit above 6,000 at this point in my career. Now, are those all homicides or are those all different kinds of deaths? Oh, no, those are all kinds of different deaths. Um, so homicides are only a part of what we, uh, uh, what we in investigate. Now, did you become involved with the autopsies of Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber? Yes. I would like to show you what has been marked as State's Exhibit 20. This is uh, a copy of my signed autopsy report on Joseph Rosenbaum. And is it true and accurate to the best of your knowledge of copy of your report? Yes, it appears to be. I'd like to move exhibit 20 into evidence. No Sir, if I'd ask, doctor, I'm sorry, if I'd ask you to put that down and look, yeah, let's look at the other exhibit there, which has been marked as state's exhibit 21. Exhibit 21 is a uh, copy of my signed autopsy report on Anthony Huber. Uh, it also includes uh, the two-page uh, toxicology report from our toxicology laboratory. Is that a true and accurate copy of the uh, exhibit or of your of your report? Yes, it is. Let's move Exhibit 21 into evidence. Objection. Doctor, do you hold uh, any board certifications? I'm board certified in anatomic pathology, clinical pathology, and in forensic pathology. And do you hold a medical license? Yes, in the state of Wisconsin. Are there any professional organizations with, to which you belong? Uh, I belong to the National Association of Medical Examiners, to the uh, American Academy of Forensic Science, uh, to the Wisconsin Corners and Medical Examiners Association. 
Now, Doctor, I'd like to uh, focus on uh, Mr. Huber first. Uh, do you recall when you did the autopsy on Mr. Huber? Yeah, the autopsy on Mr. Huber was done on the morning of August 26th of 2020. And that would be the day of or the morning after that he deceased? That was the same morning that he was pronounced deceased, yes. Now, how is a body brought to you up in Milwaukee? Um, we, uh, when someone is brought to us, uh, our investigators uh, admit them uh, to, the, uh, to the facility. They are given a un unique identifier. Um, they are uh, then basically stored in refrigeration until we uh, have the opportunity to perform an examination on them. Uh, in this case, you were able to do an examination on Mr. Huber fairly quickly? Yes. And how do you begin, let's ask this way, how did you begin your examination of Mr. Huber? Uh, well, an autopsy examination, uh, uh, it, it consists of many components, but the first thing that we do, or the first thing that I do, when somebody comes to me is I look at them as is. I uh, will look at them, uh, take photographs, collect any evidence that I find, and, uh, uh, and then we'll remove any clothing or uh, anything else from the body. Uh, again, examining the body, collecting any evidence I find, taking photographs, doing what's necessary. Um, uh, those photos are taken before anything is cleaned up, and so that's the next st step is to clean everything up, any fluids that are on the surface of the body, any dirt. Um, and then again, same process, looking, looking at the body uh, again. Um, the uh, f final thing that we, we, we do is uh, um, uh, do the internal examination, which is really what I think more people are familiar with when they think of a, an autopsy. We make incisions and that allow us to look at the organs and tissues. And again, we are looking for any evidence of, of trauma, any evidence of disease. We're collecting evidence as necessary, uh, specimens for toxicology, taking photographs. And in the end, uh, we put together all of this information uh, from the uh, external and internal examination to determine the cause of death. And were you able to determine the cause of death to Mr. Huber? Yes. And what was that cause of death? Uh, Mr. Huber died from a gunshot wound to the chest. And is that an opinion given to with a reasonable degree of medical certainty? It is. And uh, what can you tell us about this gunshot wound? Uh, so Mr. Huber has an entrance wound uh, that is just below the left nipple. Um, it uh, basically travels through his chest and creates trauma to both of the lungs and, and specifically to the heart. There's a lot of, of damage to the heart. Uh, so he has a, a large amount of, of blood within his body cavities, his chest cavities. And the, uh, the projectile didn't exit. There's actually a, a bruise and with some sc scraping uh, to the surface. And it's located to the right shoulder just beneath the collarbone. And in that location, I collected a, a, a bullet fragment. Um, so this, uh, this is the single gunshot wound, and it uh, created lethal injury involving the heart and lungs. Now, why would that gunshot wound have been lethal? What, what would have killed Mr. Huber? Uh, the, the trauma to the heart and lungs is pretty extensive from this, uh, from this wound. Uh, so he, uh, he bled from the wounds that were created by the gunshot. Did you find any blood uh, inside of his body? Uh, yes, he, he had blood within both of his chest cavities. Uh, and do you recall how much blood? Uh, he had about 1,200 milliliters of blood or over a liter of blood to the left chest cavity and he had two liters of blood to the right chest cavity. So to the best of your knowledge, would it have been the loss of blood that caused death or the damage to the organs or a combination of both? A combination of both. Now, what was the traje trajectory of the bullet or the wound path? Uh, this, this wound path had a trajectory that was left to right and upwards. Now, when you're talking about trajectory, what are you relating it to? Uh, well, in, in, in order to have a, a, a standard set of criteria to, 
to be able to discuss trajectories, we put the body in something we call anatomic position. And simply put, the anatomic position is with the person standing straight up with the palms forward. So the person's left is left, the person's right is right, superior and inferior are up and down, and front and back are relative to that person. So it's that simple. We're just creating a standard position that we can, uh, that, that we can relate to. So, Doctor, would I be demonstrating the anatomic position right now? That's correct. So, even if I was, let's say, uh, shot in my uh, stomach area from someone on the ground, the shot went up. I'm oh, sorry, let me, let me reverse that. Um, so, no matter where I was shot, it would matter the bullet how it traveled from my head to toes and from my left to my right. Correct. Were there any other notable injuries or findings on Mr. Huber? Um, Mr. Huber had some, some little abrasions or scrapes here and there, and um, he had a, a good-sized abrasion or scrape to his right thumb, and he had some uh, abrasions or scrapes to his knees and, and to the inside of his elbows. A uh, little abrasion or scrape to the lower back. Um, when I did his internal examination, he did have a little area of, of hemorrhage to the, the left side of his, his scalp, uh, the deep scalp, uh, and, um, uh, but no injuries to the skull or to the brain itself. So the other injuries were minor injuries, scrapes, and, and little bruises, but nothing of significance. Is there any way to tell if they were a part of this gunshot incident, or could they have been pre-existing injuries? No, the, these, uh, these injuries could have been pre-existing injuries, and uh, there's no way to age a, uh, a bruise or a, or a scrape to any accuracy, so uh, all I can say that those, were in, those injuries were present. I'd like to show you as a March of States of 87. Hopefully the monitors have remained on. Uh, doctor, let's see what's in marked as State's Exhibit 87. Do you recognize that? Oh, I'm sorry, I guess this is one on. One second, please. Doctor, let's see what's in marked as State's Exhibit 87. Do you recognize that? I do. And what is that? Um, well, this is, this is the entrance wound. It's uh, not clear in this photo because it appears that this photo is the one with the, uh, uh, there is a, uh, a, a patch over it which was placed uh, during resuscitation. There's a, uh, a, that looks, it's kind of a plastic gel-like patch that is placed over wounds to try to contain bleeding. And so that's over the wound, so you can't really see the, the entrance wound very well in this particular photo. Now, where is that wound? Uh, well, you can you can you can see it. You can see the hemorrhage uh, there in the middle. It's it's red. Which, I mean, I'm sorry. I should ask that better. Where in the body is that wound? Oh, this is so. This is the wound to the left side of the chest. It's just under the uh, the nipple. I'd like to move exhibit 87 into evidence. Okay. If I could have the next exhibit, please, exhibit 88. Now, uh, doctor, what are we looking at in Exhibit 88? So this is a, uh, this looks like a photograph um, that shows his face and upper chest. What you're looking at there to the, uh, the, the purple area to his right shoulder, that's the location of the bullet. The bullet is underneath the skin in that location. So it's right below the collarbone. Uh, there are a few markings on him. Can you take that pointer that uh, is in front of you there and point out this purplish area you're speaking of. There should be a wooden pointer right in front of the, uh, nope. 
I'm sorry, in front of the, on the table in front of you, I'm sorry. An old fashioned wooden pointer. Right here. Oh. Thank you. And so do I understand your testimony, that's where you found the bullet? Yes. But it was still inside of Mr. Huber? Yes, this bullet was underneath the skin, right underneath that, that bruise. For, if not already done, I'd like to move this into evidence. Objection. Uh, the next exhibit, please. This is State's Exhibit 89. Uh, do you recognize this, sir? Yes, this is another another photo of his. You can see his torso and his uh, uh, lower part of his face to the left of the photo. The white things on his body are defibrillator pads. So this is from resuscitation. Again, you can see the the two wounds that we that we just showed. You can see the the purple injury to his right shoulder, and you can see the uh, red area of hemorrhage surrounding the entrance wound. Uh, which is to his left side of his chest. It's, again, it's covered by a, uh, a, a patch that's uh, meant to contain hemorrhage. So, Doctor, if you just could, could you please on that screen, uh, to the best of your uh, knowledge, trace what the path of the bullet would have been given those two injuries? Sure. So it would have entered uh, by his, on his left chest and then traveled uh, to his right shoulder. Yes. That's accurate? That's accurate. You may, you may have a seat. Thank you, doctor. That too is a bit 89 in evidence. Now I'd like to move on to Mr. Rosenbaum. I believe you also did the autopsy of Mr. Rosenbaum. Yes, I did. Do you recall if these came in at the same time or if you did one first or do you have any recollection of that? Uh, I don't have a re recollection of that. Mr. Rosenbaum, uh, his examination was performed uh, the following day. It was performed on August 27th of 2020. And did you do the same procedure that you described Mr. Huber in terms of taking photographs and initial appearances and then cleaning and then doing a further examination? Same procedure. Uh, is there anything different about how Mr. Rosenbaum uh, came to you or appeared to you? Uh, when Mr. Rosenbaum uh, came to the office, his uh, clothing had been had been removed. He had been to the hospital and his clothing had been removed. Um, whereas Mr. Huber came with his clothing still still on. Um, but aside from that, I, I don't think, uh, oh well, and then the other thing was that uh, Mr. Rosenbaum came with the hands covered by paper bags to protect possible evidence. But uh, other than those things, I think that uh, I don't think there was anything else. So what did you first notice about Mr. Uh, Rosenbaum? Uh, well, uh, Mr. Rosenbaum uh, had uh, several injuries that uh, were related to gunshot wounds. Um, that's, that's what I noticed initially, yes. And did you perform any x-rays on or any other imaging on Mr. Huber or Mr. Rosenbaum? Yes, x-rays are uh, taken prior to the autopsy examination. That allows us to look for skeletal injuries as well as to locate any projectiles or projectile fragments, bullets or bullet fragments. Were you able to come to a conclusion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty on the what caused the death of Mr. Rosenbaum? Yes. What was that? Mr. Rosenbaum died from multiple gunshot wounds. And uh, in his physical examination, was there anything of note that would have led to a questioning or a uh, addition to that cause of death? Uh, no. Do you know how many gunshot wounds Mr. that you found on Mr. Rosenbaum? 
Uh, well, Mr. Rosenbaum has a number of injuries. Um, there are um, uh, two injuries in which uh, the bullet entered the body and did not exit, so I collected bullets from those injuries. There's a third injury that is a graze wound in which the bullet just grazed the skin superficially. And then there is uh, a, uh, a gunshot wound to the left hand and an area to the left thigh that appear to uh, be separate but may actually be, um, I, I think they're related uh, to the same uh, gunshot wound. Now, before we get too far into this, what is stippling? Um, okay, so I think to explain that I have to back up one step and just uh, remind you that more than just the bullet comes out of the end of the gun. Uh, so uh, flame comes out of the gun, smoke and soot comes out of the gun, unburned gunpowder particles come out of the end of the gun, and of course then the bullet comes out. Um, what we do in forensic pathology is we look for injuries on the body or evidence on the body that allows us to estimate the distance of the muzzle of the gun to the surface of the body. And so in, in contact wounds, we might actually see a, scrapes around the entrance site uh, from the muzzle of the gun, from the skin actually hitting the muzzle of the gun. It's called a muzzle stamp, so that's a contact wound. Um, uh, out to a certain distance, soot will actually be able to deposit on the skin. It's obviously not very aerodynamic, so after about a foot or so, soot is, is imperceptible. But and it depends on the weapon uh, to how far that can be seen. Um, but soot will tell us that the muzzle of the gun is within a, a pretty close distance. And then the gunpowder that comes out, those little gunpowder particles, they also have uh, a velocity to them, so they have energy. So they have kinetic energy that can cause damage to the surface of the skin. So when they hit the skin, if they have enough energy, they can actually cause little scrapes. And those little scrapes or abrasions are little punctate, little round punctate or small elongated injuries to the skin that surround the perforation. And of course, the closer you are, the more dense it is. And as they, as they travel through the, through the air, they spread out and create a, a wider and less dense pattern around the injury to, until a point where you can't see them anymore. They don't have enough injury, uh, uh, energy to create an injury on the surface of the skin. That is called gunpowder stippling. So when the gunpowder creates an injury to the skin, we call that gunpowder stippling and that indicates an intermediate range gunshot wound. Um, so that's just one of the things that we use to estimate the distance of the muzzle from the, the surface of the body. And then everything else is referred to as indeterminate because we, we, uh, we, we can't tell. We don't use the word distance. Um, we use the word indeterminate because we can't see anything. Uh, that doesn't mean that something didn't get in the way or filter out the gunpowder particles in the soot. So we just say anything without any evidence of, uh, of gunpowder stippling or soot around a, a wound is indeterminate. So when you talk about gunpowder stippling, we're talking about an intermediate range gunshot wound. Uh, you, there's a term I see in your report uh, called pseudo stippling. What is pseudo stippling? Um, Obviously, anything that hits the skin and leaves a, uh, an abrasion um, will you know, leave a mark that we will make note of. Uh, if something other than gunpowder hits the surface of the skin and creates those abrasions, we'll often refer to, we'll refer to those as pseudo, pseudo stippling. And so if the bullet goes through an intermediate target, so if it goes through uh, another body part, if it goes through a window, if it goes through a door, the uh, particles of those surfaces uh, might actually travel with some force downstream and hit the surface of the body, creating those same types of injuries. But those look very different than gunpowder stippling. They're, they vary in size and shape. They sometimes are irregular, some are small, some are big. 
um, but that's called pseudo stippling. And that can be caused by a number of different things, as I just pointed out. It can also be caused by uh, a bullet ricocheting off of something. So it can break, break up a surface and cause those particles of the bullet and particles of that surface to travel and hit the body. And so that is called pseudo stippling. It's not the same as gunpowder stippling. I'd like to first talk about a gunshot wound to the pelvis. Uh, what can you tell me about that gunshot wound? So Mr. Rosenbaum has a gunshot wound to the right side of the pelvis. Um, or actually, it's to the right side of the groin. And that gunshot wound passes uh, into, the, into the body and hits the pelvis, uh, creates a, 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 a quite bad fracture to the right side of the pelvis. And then that bullet continues, and there is an area of bruising to the right buttock. Um, there's actually a little, a, a, a little uh, perforation where the bullet couldn't quite get through. But in that location, under that uh, little incomplete exit, that's where I found the bullet from that gunshot wound. Um, so this gunshot wound actually um, uh, has some stippling, gunpowder stippling associated with it. Um, it's to the lower abdomen. And interestingly enough, where his waistline is at, there's no stippling below that point. So there, it's not surrounding this entrance wound. It's actually above to the abdomen. But it's because he's wearing the, the, the clothing, and the clothing didn't allow that gunpowder to get to the surface of the, uh, of the uh, body in the groin region. But it did in the lower abdomen. So we see that gunpowder stepping to the lower abdomen. It's associated with this entrance wound to the right groin. And that is an intermediate range gunshot wound. So what is intermediate range? Uh, as I said, a intermediate range is, uh, it, it depends on the weapon and the, the, the uh, type of ammunition used. Uh, typically, typically, when you see gunpowder stippling, you're looking at uh, a muzzle to target distance of a few feet. Um, but again, it depends on whether you're talking about a handgun or rifle or, or such. Um, I would say that in this particular instance, we're talking about something uh, within a few feet, within four feet or so. And, and that's knowing that the defendant fired with an AR-15 rifle with 223 caliber ammunition? That's right. So you, you would, you'd estimate that, to, I just want to be, be clear, you're saying that he was about four feet away or he was within four feet? Uh, I'm saying that, that well, the best way of putting it is the only way to, to be more accurate is to test fire the weapon and uh, see what kind of a, a pattern you get because the density of that gunpowder stippling pattern might help you somewhat. But this is pretty spread out. Um, so it, all we can really say is that it's within a few feet, but I can't be any more specific. And what was the path of that gunshot wound? Uh, it's basically front to back and a little left to right. And in your medical opinion, is this the kind of shot that would have resulted in loss of life? Uh, it's not an immediately lethal wound. Uh, no, obviously, you know, all gunshot wounds can, can produce morbidity and, and mortality. But uh, in this particular instance, this is not an immediately lethal wound. Now, Doctor, I'd like to talk to you about a gunshot wound. Did you find any wounds to the hand? The left hand has a gunshot wound. Um, it's a very complex wound. There is tearing of the skin to the palmar surface at the base of the uh, index and middle fingers. There's a tear that extends up the middle finger, and there's actually some, uh, uh, a lot of soot to this area and tearing to the underlying soft tissues. Uh, that soot continues to the other fingers of the palmar surface of the hand. Um, 
this wound is associated with fracturing to the first bone of the index finger, so the bone just beyond the knuckle. That bone is fractured by this wound path. Uh, and then it exits uh, to the uh, back of the hand just, just beyond the, uh, the knuckle of the index finger. So if we were to put this into anatomic position, which we talked about a minute ago with the palm forward, this, the trajectory of this wound path with the hand in anatomic position is uh, basically front to back, right to left, and a little bit upwards. Did you recover any bullet fragments from that wound? Uh, no. You mentioned that, uh, was there any stippling or any indicate or soot or anything of that nature in this wound? Uh, this, wolf, this wound does have soot associated with it. There's uh, a fair amount of soot to the, like I said, the palmar surface of, of that hand. Uh, so clearly this wound represents something closer, what I call a close range gunshot wound. And do you have any idea where that bullet would have went after it went through the hand? Um, it, uh, I think that it makes sense that this wound is associated with another wound that is to the, the lateral or the outside of the left thigh. Um, it's, it's kind of to the lower left thigh, but the, um, that area has a very irregular large area of abrasion and multiple small perforations. And in one of these perforations, I actually recovered a small fragment of a bullet. Um, the x-ray shows that there's additional very, very small um, uh, metal fragments in the, in the left thigh as well, which I, I didn't recover. Um, so this injury to the left, uh, outside of the left thigh, um, this is very characteristic of a, a ricochet type wound. In other words, I think the bullet hit something, ricocheted, breaking up the bullet and that surface, and that showered the, the, the left lateral thigh and created these injuries. Um, it appears that the, one, the gunshot wound that could have caused that would be the one related to the left hand as well. So I think that uh, the uh, gunshot wound to the left hand passed through made impact with the pavement and fragmented, fragmenting some of the pavement as well, and that this created the injury to the left thigh uh, as well as to the, the left hand. Now the hand injury, uh, would that, would you consider that to be an injury that would quickly cause death? No, that's not a lethal wound either. And this injury to the left thigh, is that, uh, is that the kind of injury that would cause death? No, it's not. Uh, would, it be, would it be fair to say that's something of a superficial wound? Yes. Now I'd like to talk to you about a gunshot wound to the head. What can you tell me about that? Well, to the right frontal area of the head. Um, so, so basically the right lateral forehead. Um, there is a graze wound, as I mentioned previously. So this is a superficial injury in which uh, the, the bullet grazed the, grazed the surface of the skin or created an abrasion or scrape. And based on the appearances of the edge of this, of this wound, it appears to be traveling in a back to front and downward orientation. Uh, and there's no, obviously no bullet or bullet fragments recovered from the, from the body on a, a wound like this. So when you're saying back to front, the injury, the bullet actually made contact towards the rear of the head first and then traveled towards the front of the head? It, yes, it's, it's, it's uh, the angle is sharply downwards, uh, so, but it's from back to front and, and downwards. Now, is that wound, would that be considered to be a wound that would be immediately fatal? No, it's not. 
Now, doctor, I'd like to talk to you about a uh, gunshot wound to the chest and the abdomen. What can you tell me about that gunshot wound? Well, this, this gunshot wound to Mr. Rosenbaum, it enters the back uh, about an inch to the left of the upper midline. Um, and this is the one that passes through the right chest cavity. Um, it uh, creates a great deal of injury to the right lung. Uh, there's blood within the right chest cavity. It then uh, perforates the, the diaphragm uh, at the base of the lung and enters the liver, which is right under the diaphragm. It creates a great deal of injury to the liver. Um, uh, there's fracturing of several ribs in association with this wound path as well. But then the wound path, um, after creating all this injury, it passes into the right flank. And there was a, uh, a bruise to the right flank under which I collected a, uh, a bullet. Now, we've talked about how the other injuries were not ones that would immediately cause a mortal wound. Uh, what impact do you believe that this gunshot would have had on Mr. Rosenbaum? Uh, this gunshot wound is a lethal injury. And what do you mean by that? Uh, this uh, gunshot wound is the uh, uh, one that would cause um, death as a result of the injuries to the lungs and the liver with the hemorrhage and the uh, injury to the organs themselves. Is that to a reasonable degree of medical Certainty? Yes. Now, what was the trajectory of this gunshot wound? This gunshot wound is downward, left to right, and back to front. I'd like to pull up the next exhibit, please, on Mr. Rosenbaum. TVs are off. <coughs> While we're setting this up, doctor, were you able to establish uh, the size of Mr. Rosenbaum during this autopsy? Uh, his height and weight, you mean? Yes. Uh, yeah, he, uh, he's five foot four inches tall and he weighed uh, 153 pounds. Dr. Lester, what's it marked as uh, exhibit 90? What is this? You're looking at the graze wound to his head. Now, when you say it's back to front, how can you tell that? In order to determine that, you have to look at it very closely. You have to look at the edges. And typically, um, a projectile that uh, travels along the surface of the skin will create tearing of the skin. And the way that it tears the skin helps you to determine its direction. In this case, the the direction of the tears tells you the direction the bullet is going. So it kind of, it kind of pushes through the tissue, tears it as it goes, and it's those specific tears as you go along that you can uh, use to determine this. So you indicated the trajectory of this bullet was uh, back to front and downwards, and that's in the anatomical position? That's correct. Um, I'd like to move exhibit 90 into evidence. Next exhibit, please. Now, Doctor, I'd like to show you exhibit 91. Do you recognize this? Yes. What is that? What you're looking at is to the left side of the picture next to that scale um, with the numbers on it. That's the knee of the left leg. And right above the left knee, you're looking at the lateral left thigh and the injury is that area of scraping a red abrasion right above it. It's very irregular in its appearance. Now is this the injury that you've opined was caused by debris or by a bullet fragmenting? Yes, by, uh, by ricochet. And is there evidence of the pseudo stippling which you talked about? Um, you can you can see that in addition to the the main body of the uh, uh, abrasion, you can see some very small areas of, uh, of abrasions or scrapes there above it, 
and below it. And those little areas are separate impact sites. Those are separate uh, projectiles, if you will. So this entire area is, uh, is, is a, an atypical wound. I'd like to move exhibit 91 in evidence. Exhibit 92, please. Uh, doctor, what is this? Uh, this is a picture before cleaning up. Uh, it's a picture of the palmar surface of the left hand. So this is where the injury to the left hand is located. And can you indicate, uh, if you can, where the entrance wound is? Um, so if you look at the, uh, the middle finger and to the right side of the middle finger, it's, it's really difficult to see in this particular photograph. But to the right side of the middle finger there, that's where the uh, beginning of the injury is at. That's where the entrance is, so to speak. I, I apologize. Could you use that pointer and point it out? It is difficult to see. Stay there and we'll, we'll try to do it this way. Did everyone hear that? Now, there's some dark markings all over the hand. What is that? Let's move exhibit 92 into evidence. No objection. Proceed. Next exhibit, please. Uh, doctor, what are we looking at here? This is, this is a photograph that shows the exit wound from the left hand. So what you're looking at here is the index finger and the thumb, and this irregular area here, this round area, is the uh, exit point. Let's move exhibit 93 into evidence. Any objection? Can I have a number again? 93. No objection. Proceed. Now, and that is the exit wound that you believe would have then went and struck perhaps the pavement and caused the thigh injury? Let's see what is it marked as 94? Is it 94? Do you recognize that? This is another photograph of the uh, palmar surface of the left hand. And again, you can see this is the rounded area here, uh, the beginning of the, of the wound path here, this tearing here. This is all the laceration or tearing that extends along the wound path. This black material here, 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 uh, you can see a little bit here too. All that black material is the soot, um, and the, the exit wound is going to be on the other side of the hand about right here. I'd like to move exhibit 94 in evidence. No objection. Proceed. Next please, exhibit 95. And doctor, what is this? bit better, you can see the injury to the middle finger here again. Uh, you can see the irregularity to it. You can see the black soot. Uh, you can see some soot up here as well. Uh, in the background, you can see the tearing. But this is basically showing the uh, injury to the uh, middle finger. What is, what is the white, the whiteness sort of in the middle of the finger? Are those bones or ligaments or what is that? 
Um, actually, to the index finger, you're probably seeing this it's, it's a little more red or pink, but um, there, you, you could see the ligament uh, to, the, uh, to the middle finger. The index finger, there was both exposed ligament and fragments of bone. That's where the fracture was at. I think we have a 95 in evidence. Next, please. I'd like to see what is marked as States Exhibit 96. Do you recognize that? Uh, yes. What is that? This is uh, a picture before it's cleaned up. This is a picture of the uh, um, entrance wound to the right groin region. Um, genitalia would be in the upper right corner there uh, next to the uh, top of the scale. Uh, there's a lot of blood on this, so it's, it's difficult to see things, but the entrance wound is right here. And, and what is the redness around the wound? Um, that's that's all blood. There's, so there's uh, wet and dry blood still to the surface of the body. This is before uh, he's been cleaned up. I like to use 96 in evidence. Objection. Doctor, what is this? This photograph uh, is a picture of Mr. Rosenbaum's back. Uh, you can see the entrance wound is this dark brown injury here. Um, there is a pattern of gunpowder stippling to the left side of the back that extends around the, uh, the wound. So you can see it uh, with, uh, extending all the way from the back of the left shoulder down to the area around the entrance wound. Next was at 97 in evidence. Objection. Proceed. Doctor, I looked at so you exhibit 98. What is this? up photograph, uh, so after the removal of uh, blood, uh, this is a cleaned up photograph of the graze wound to the right side of the head. So this is after he, you've, that Mr. Rosenbaum has been washed or cleaned up? That's correct. Next like move exhibit 98 in evidence. Uh, doctor, this is Exhibit 99. What is this? Uh, this is a uh, closer photograph of the uh, left hand showing the exit wound. What you're looking at is the thumb is here to the left. The index finger is underneath the scale. And this round area is the, uh, the exit wound. That was 99 to evidence. Objection. Doctor, what are we looking at here? This is the injury to the left hand after it's been cleaned up somewhat. Uh, you can see here's the thumb, the index finger, the middle finger. This area along the middle finger is a ragged area with, which represents the beginning of the wound path earlier, you can see the black areas here all along the uh, wound as well as to the adjacent uh, ring finger. That's all soot. You can see some of the soot here at the base of the index finger. And again, there's this glass or this laceration that extends along the palmar surfaces of those two uh, fingers. I think we 100 in evidence. Doctor, what are we looking at here? This photograph depicts the, this is the knee right here in the middle. Um, this injury up here is that atypical injury to the lower uh, lateral left thigh. Uh, you can see the, the main body of the irregular abrasion. You can see the smaller uh, abrasion surrounding it. This right here 
to the left knee is an abrasion or scrape. So this is just a, a, a scrape of the left knee. And what relevance do you believe this has to this case? Um, it, it, it possibly could have happened when he went down to the ground or was on the ground. Exclusive 101 into evidence. And for the final exhibit, doctor, uh, what is this? This is a close-up photograph uh, after he's been cleaned up of the entrance gunshot wound to the right groin. Let's move exhibit 102 into evidence. Steve. Um, you may sit back down. Thank you, doctor. Now, as a medical examiner, uh, is all you do or all you're allowed to do is look at the body? Uh, no. Uh, what else can your uh, medical examiner, is it fair to say you perform an investigation? Uh, yes, we, uh, we uh, collect information about the circumstances of the case. Um, we'll look at photographs, uh, scene photographs or other photographs, we'll look at video from scenes. We'll look at a lot of different things in order to uh, understand the circumstances better and perhaps help us to uh, answer other questions. And did you review anything else in this case that would aided you in your investigation in terms of Mr. Rosenbaum? Uh, several things were, were reviewed uh, for Mr. Rosenbaum, uh, specifically um, a, a video, YouTube video was referenced to uh, exemplify the, the, the circumstances of the, uh, uh, of the, the shooting. Um, I reviewed some uh, other records, medical records and things, which is routine, but, uh, but that, actually that was about it with Mr. Rosenbaum. Defense Exhibit 41. If you do, do you recognize this? Y yes. What is that? Um, I th th that appears to be the an, an introductory screen from a, a video that was referenced to me. Uh, I, I was told to look at this video for reference. Um, in understanding or in seeing the scene of the shooting better. And is that because it's the same video that Dr. Jensen, the defense expert, reviewed? Uh, yes, I, I believe so. And after watching that video, um, are you able to tell us anything about the first two gunshots? Um, the, if trying to uh, d determine some kind of order of gunshots, um, obviously the autopsy itself is, is, is not going to allow us to do that. We can use the injuries uh, and the, the, the details about those injuries to help us, but um, the autopsy alone is not going to uh, to allow you to, to, to do that and also is not going to allow you to know what position the person is in when they were when they were shot. Um, you know we put things in, in terms of anatomic position but uh, we seldom know exactly what position they were in when they uh, when the gunshot wound was incurred. So the use of the video can sometimes be uh, uh, helpful 
in answering those questions. And really with regards to the video, uh, and there really was only one very small uh, uh, portion of that entire video that um, uh, helps me, and I think that uh, it's the uh, uh, portion where there's actually some sound so I can, I can hear the gunshots uh, and see the position of Mr. Rosenbaum at that time that you hear the discharge of the, of the weapon. Um, and so that's what, I, that's what I use the video for, is mainly to just to see what position he was in when I hear those gunshots. And so really um, knowing that he had, he had these, these gunshot wounds uh, to different areas, he's got an entrance wound to the, to the front of his body, the, the right groin, he's got an entrance wound to the upper back, he's got, an he's got a graze wound to the, to the head. And so in looking at the video and uh, paying attention to his body position when I heard the discharge of the weapon, I was at least able to say that the only time uh, during the interaction in which he could have incurred the gunshot wounds to the, uh, to the back and to the right side of the head is when he's more horizontal. And the only time that that happens is, is uh, the, the last two gunshot wounds. So I think the, the first two gunshot wounds are represented by the, um, uh, the, the, the injury to the groin and the injury to the left thigh. Um, there is a, um, uh, it's, it's not the, the greatest video for, uh, uh, not the clearest video, but um, right after the second gunshot wound, there's also some kind of a, a cloud, uh, it, it seems. There's some kind of a cloud of smoke or something like that. And uh, I, I felt this was consistent with a, uh, a bullet hitting the pavement and creating that cloud, and therefore that would, uh, would be related to the uh, injury to the left thigh. Uh, so really that's how I uh, use the, the, the video, just to uh, determine when he's in position to receive um, um, certain gunshot wounds. So doctor, is your testimony that in the video you reviewed, uh, which the jury has seen, uh, you, the, the first gunshots are while Mr. Rosenbaum is facing Mr. Rittenhouse? Yes. And you said that at least one of those was intermediate out to four feet away? Uh, yes. And then uh, you see in the video that uh, Mr. Rosenbaum continues going forward and he begins to uh, tilt or fall and is it your opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty that the back to front shots to the head and then the kill shot to the back would have been while he was falling or perpendicular to the ground? Uh, the, the only way that the uh, trajectories of the gunshot wounds to the right side of the head and the back make sense is if he's more horizontal to the ground and that is occurring um, at the time that the last two gunshot wounds are heard on the video. Doctor, in your uh, to the best of your medical knowledge and opinion, um, if an individual is moving forward and they sustain that injury uh, that entered by the groin and went to the hip, uh, could that cause them to fold forward and kind of move forward or move down in a downward position? Uh, th that's possible. There is a, um, a, a very complex fracture involving the right side of the pelvis, which um, uh, may make the, the pelvis and the right leg more unstable, but uh, all I can say is that that's a possibility. Anything else? <clears throat> Doctor, we talked about this hand wound and where and how that occurred. Um, if someone is pointing a rifle at you, an AR-15, do you have an explanation of how that hand could be positioned that would result in the injury shown and then also uh, perhaps the injury to the thigh from that same round? Well, as I said, this is a, a close range injury. Um, and uh, so his hand is in close proximity or in contact with the end of that rifle. Um, so 
you, you can you can kind of think of it in your in your head. You know, if you put if you put the end of the rifle close to that trajectory through his hand, um, you move the hand around. That's you can put it in different uh, relationships to the body that uh, can explain that. Uh, typically, by turning the palm towards the ground, it would make make uh, sense that it could uh, go through the hand, hit the ground, and then create the injuries to the uh, uh, the left side of the thigh. So it's consistent that the hand with the palm was to the ground, and then it would have entered by the middle finger, gone through, and then exited the end of the index finger, and then hit the ground? Yes. And just to be clear, uh, we've only heard four gunshots. Um, is it possible that the four gunshots caused all five wounds? Yes. I have nothing further. Thank you. Uh, please don't talk about the case during the break. Read, watch, or listen to any account of the trial. Uh, let's aim for uh, actual time of, uh, of 11 o'clock.
Would you come down, please? Yes. Pardon me? Okay. Okay, you may be seated. Good afternoon. It's still morning. Sorry, it's been a long day. Doctor, talking about generally stippling, stipling, comes if this, I'm holding up the pointer, the back end of the pointer, the thick end, the barrel of the gun here. Do we have agreement with that? Yes. If this gun fires a projectile, the first thing that comes out, and I'm not saying in order, but what would show nearness is soot stippling, correct? Correct. And then further out would be gunpowder stippling. It, yes, soot and then gunpowder Okay, right. and in the soot stippling, it has to be, generally speaking, as you said, either in contact or within a foot. Yes, it's, very, it's within a few inches, it's very close. Okay, and when you looked at the state's exhibit, you talked about, you said it was either very close or in contact, and we're talking about the hand wound. Yes, it could, it could be within that, within that range, okay. so it could have been in contact. Okay, and as I said, if this is the barrel of the gun, this is my left hand, the barrel of the gun had to be Somewhere's in this area, correct? That's correct. Now, the soot stippling, and I'm pointing with the pointer to my baby finger, there is no soot stippling here, correct? Uh, I believe that's correct, yes. Okay. The bulk of it starts between what would be the ring and commonly referred to as middle finger? Yes. Okay, so that means the barrel of the gun, if not touching, would have been like this. It's in that location, that's okay. correct. So that hand was over the barrel of Mr. Rittenhouse's gun when his hand was shot. That makes sense. Okay, and the bullet goes into the fingers and then out through here. And I'm showing the fat part of the in between my index and thumb. Yes, the exit is is to the index finger, but it's on the the back.
back of the lateral side of that finger, yes. And exhibit 105, please. Just went over. I'm showing you an exhibit be up on the screen. It's been marked Defense Exhibit 105. You see that photo uh, exhibit? Yes. Okay, and that's Mr. Rosenbaum's um, hand. His left hand. Left correct. hand, and you took that photograph, correct? Uh, yes. Um, circle on here to the best of your ability where the soot starts. Can you um, draw a line off of there into where it can be seen and then just put your initials? Thank you. And you put the circle on the ring finger, correct? Correct. Leaving the baby finger uncircled and blank, correct? Correct. I don't see any. You don't see any soot there, right? Correct. Now, you would agree that this shooting of Mr. Rosenbaum, which is captured partially on video, is a dynamic situation, correct? Correct. And if the furthest he was away with the stipling that you see in the wounds was four feet and closing, that goes very quickly, correct? If someone's running at you? Yes. Okay. And four feet... is about from me to you away. That's about correct. And if I had my hands out, I'm even closer, correct? Yes. If I'm lunging and going for your gun, which is an extension away from your body, closer still. Yes. And you saw the video that Dr. Jensen reviewed, and he was running, correct? He was. The wound in the back, when you talk about, I can get out to that word, anatomically um, correct position? A atomic position, Ato yes. That's, as I'm standing here before you, standing straight, with you said palms forward. Correct, okay. anatomic okay. position. Okay. I, I think you had me doing it. Okay. And the wound enters his back. That's correct. Okay. And goes down and across. Correct. Okay. We're not, and, and I know the prosecution covered it, but we're not saying that he was turned and shot in the back, correct? That's correct. There's nothing in the hand shot that shows him, would lead you to believe that his hands are up like this surrendering, correct? That's correct. I did not see that in the video. And your theory or your belief to a reasonable degree of medical certainty is that he's in a horizontal position close to my client, the bullet goes in and across and down. That's correct. Okay, so once again, in the position of lunging would put you in a horizontal position, correct? It would. And there's some stipling, stippling to the wound in the pelvis, correct? Uh, yes, to the lower abdomen above okay. it. Okay, and that's not trying to, but there, it starts at the belt line and goes up, correct? That, that's right. Okay, and as it starts at the belt line and goes up, the reason it's not below the belt line is because he was wearing pants when he was shot, correct? Yes, that's right. Okay. And that was also, that was gunpowder, 
stippling. That's correct. Okay, so that's basically one foot to four feet. Yes. And I hate to jump around here, but the wound on Mr. Huber, I'm, I'm assuming at some point you pulled off that bandage that was on the wound? Yes. Okay. Now, was there stippling on that wound? There was, yes. Okay. And that wound was what kind of stippling? Uh, well, gunpowder stippling. So that that wound has the impacts from the gunpowder particles, okay. a more dense distribution. Did you look at the clothing around the wound? Uh, on Mr. Huber? On Mr. Huber? Yes. Okay. And the clothing also had gunpowder residue? Um, it, a little more difficult to say on the clothing. I can, uh, Mr. Huber's tank top, which was the item of clothing that came with him, that tank top had, it was a tie-dyed black and gray and white appearance, so made that very difficult. So in those situations, usually I, uh, I will defer to, to try to opine if I can't tell for sure. Okay, so there's nothing in that gunshot wound that suggests that he wasn't in close contact with my client's firearm. Uh, that's right. Okay. And did you look at any video regarding that shooting? Yes, it's uh, also included in that okay. video provided. And the video shows that my client's lying on his back, correct? Yes. Mr. Huber grabs the firearm, correct? It, it appears so, yes. Pulls the firearm from one direction towards and into his chest, correct? Uh, it, it, they end up in that position. I don't know if he's pulling or what. I don't know what's going on there. Mr. Huber strikes him with the skateboard. The gun is not in his chest. Fair statement? That fair statement. Okay. When he's shot, the skateboard is in his right hand. The gun is now up in his chest. Jeff, these are conclusions based on... I'm asking if his wound is consistent with this scenario. Go ahead. Finish your question. Okay. I'll start over. Mr. Huber, you see him hit my client in the head with the skateboard, correct? Yes. Sure. And... hit or did anything is central to this case. It's, it, these are not conclusions that anyone can make but the jury. Uh, he said, the doctor said he watched the video, and so I'm assuming that that's his knowledge base, um, and you can re, uh, redirect on the subject if you want. I'll start again, sir. There is a blow from Mr. Huber to my client's head with a skateboard, correct? Yes, the skateboard makes contact okay. with Mr. He swings the skateboard with his right hand into my client's back neck range, correct? I'm not sure where it makes impact, but... You see an impact. It, yeah, it makes contact. And he reaches down with his left hand, seeming to grab my client's gun, correct? Yes. When he puts his hand on the gun, the barrel is not pointing in his chest, correct? Uh, I, I don't recall, but I don't think so. Okay. And... Through whatever movement between my client and Mr. Huber, the gun barrel ends up, which would be right about here. It does. Okay. And there's a gunshot, correct? Yes. And that gun is touching his clothes. Uh, it's it, it's in intermediate range. It's so closer. And define intermediate range for me, please. Well, again, we've talked about how intermediate range injuries can be within four feet and but it obviously from the video it's closer than that but I can't say whether the muzzle is in contact with oh, okay his but clothing through the type of stippling that you have on the Huber wound you know it's less than four feet fair statement that's a fair statement through independent evidence which you review as a forensic pathologist slash investigator 
the video evidence establishes closer. It does. And just assume for the purposes of this question that the first shot from my client moving back to Mr. Rosenbaum now is the zero shot, number one. The fourth shot is 76 hundredths of a second after that. That is how fast the four shots were fired out of my client's gun. And he goes from the furthest four feet to touching the gun, correct? Uh, yes. It's a doctor answered yes. And your opining <laughs> regarding the order of shots, is that to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty or medical certainty? I apologize. Uh, medical certainty, as I pointed out, from the autopsy findings alone, um, you you can't put these in order. It's only by reviewing the video and and, and simply looking at the orientation of his body and, co and comparing that to the findings on the body that you can do that. So uh, to that degree of certainty, it, it appears that he's in that horizontal position. And the, Mr. Kuros asked it, the shot to the pelvis, you think is first? I think that makes the most sense. Okay. The shot that goes in the scalp, second? No, I, I think that the, the, the only orientation that makes sense with the trajectory, traje, excuse me, tra, trajectory of the gunshot wound to the back and the right side of the head is when he's in more of a horizontal position. So those two injuries must be the third and the fourth injuries. Uh, but that, that's and the best I can do. The head wound goes back to front and from the top of the head down towards the forehead. That's right. Okay, so if I was charging like a bull and diving, that would be consistent. Uh, it would be. I have nothing further. Doctor, the injuries you uh, noted, they'd also be consistent with falling after being struck in the hip? Yes. So if Mr. Rosenbaum was struck in the hip, that to say his momentum kept carrying him forward, he was falling, the other three shots could have been as he was falling? That's, that's possible too. But it's consistent with that? It is. What is a muzzle stamp? Well, a muzzle stamp is what we, we, we briefly talked about earlier with contact gunshot wounds. And um, if the, the energy of the bullet entering the body causes the skin to smack against the muzzle of the gun, it can leave an abrasion, even a patterned abrasion in the shape of the muzzle of the gun uh, on the skin. And so a muzzle stamp is a term that's used for uh, a contact abrasion that's associated with a contact gunshot wound. Um, and the reason why, I, I, when we talked about a, a close range wound to the, uh, to the hand, the reason why we, you know, we didn't talk about that, although uh, it could be in close range like that, is because the skin of the palm is much thicker and it very seldom, if ever, allows for a muzzle stamp or an abrasion of that sort. Certainly not like you would see for, with a contact wound to the head or to the chest. So there, so there was no muzzle stamp in this case? No. Okay, I'd like to, I'd like to ask uh, Investigator Stu to pull up Exhibit 41, but as we're doing that, Doctor, if this is the gun, if you 
could stand up, please. If I'm holding a rifle, let's just say that I, I shoot, I've shot you in the hip, how does it make sense that the uh, gunshot to the hand occurs in the trajectory you indicated? in the direction. Uh, oh, thank you. Can you stand uh, back there? Hold that. No, I know. I'm fine here. Okay. Okay. So, we're talking about the left hand. The injuries are to the palmar surface of the index and the middle fingers. The exit is to the side of the index finger. So it's, obviously it's hard to do this completely, but it's like this. So in the anatomic position, it looks like that. But keeping in mind that your arm and your hand uh, move in a lot of different ways. so. Um, so if you were to take the hand and you were to be in a position in which the hand was like this with the palm kind of downward, you could orient this so that you could explain the gunshot wound going down and hitting the pavement and then the fragments hitting the left side of the, of the thigh. Uh, if you could put your hand out again, doctor, like you had. So, but the barrel would have to be behind the injury, correct? Yes. So. The bullet would have had to travel outside of the barrel, so the barrel would have been had to have been in front of or somehow separated from where the wound took place. Uh, well, that's what I said. I, I, I can't tell that. This is a close range wound with soot, but there isn't going to be a muzzle stamp because of the skin of the palm. So it's, it's within that distance, but uh, whether it's in contact or whether it's just in front of it, of the entrance portion of the wound or inches away, that's not something I can tell you. Would that orientation you just indicated be consistent with swiping something away? Swiping a barrel away? Uh, I, I can't tell you what he was doing at the time that that happened. All I can tell you is that at the time of the discharge of the weapon, and the traveling of that bullet into his hand, um, this is the trajectory that it took through his hand. I, I can't tell you what he was doing at the time, uh, and I certainly I can't see it on the video. Uh, the video is not good enough for that. Exhibit 41, Is, could have holding something in your hand, could that impact the wounds or the stippling or the soot or anything of that nature? You mean, well, I mean, if you're, if you're holding something in your hand and you're referring to uh, some kind of a, something that's gonna create an intermediary target or something, um, yeah, that can, that can affect the appearance of wounds. Um, you know, the, the, the injury might look very different in that case. So when Attorney Richards was talking to you about the wound to Mr. Rosenbaum's left hand and there's blood everywhere and there's soot many places, uh, if he was holding, say, uh, the, a handle of something, uh, would you expect that the soot and the... And the judge's calls for speculation. There's been no evidence whatsoever that he had anything in his hand. Questions must be asked uh, to a reasonable degree of um, post-mortem autopsy certitude. Would that be a fair way to put it? I'm not. I'm, I'm not really sure. I understand the question. You're not the first. Not the, first. Uh, um, the, uh, the, the, the the you you you. 
uh, hesitated before when asked about medical certitude, which is a common expression we use in the courts, uh, and I'm trying to, to, to see what degree of, how would you phrase the degree of certitude with which you would typically respond? Well, I can, I can testify to a reasonable degree of medical certainty when I'm using the autopsy findings and the, the, the meaning of those in reference to the injuries. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I, I've seen the video. I, as I have testified, I discussed the video with regards to his, his position when I heard the gunshot wounds discharge. Um, I can't really see what's going on in front of him at those times. So when the questions are going into those specifics, I, I don't think I can answer those uh, from the video that I watched. So I, I think I'm trying to be careful not to over uh, evaluate that video more than, uh, more than I used it for, which is to, to determine what position he was in when those gunshot wounds were received. Uh, why don't you rephrase your question? What we're required, what, what's required here for the state certainly, but frankly for both parties, but is a, a degree of certitude um, which the, uh, to which the physician can testify. The, the injuries and everything you testified to on the left hand, that's consistent with nothing being in his hand? It is, yes. Thank you. Um, I'd like to direct your attention to Exhibit 41. If you can tell, is this the video that you uh, reviewed in terms of both the shooting deaths of Mr. Rosenbaum and Mr. Huber? It, it is. I'd ask you to play the video until I ask you to stop. Can you see where on there you, you indicate that he would be positioned with the first shot? Yes, I can, I can clearly see the reflection of light on his back and I can see that he's upright when the first shot is heard. So that would not be consistent with the shot to the hand? Uh, no, I think that's, uh, 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 I think that placing the hand in that position would affect the gunpowder stippling to his lower abdomen. Uh, so I don't think the hand is involved in that first shot. So to best of your, so it's consistent that the first shot is to the hip. That's what I feel. That's what I think. Yes. And then the second shot would be to the hand. Yes. And then the third or fourth shot, can you order those any more specifically? No. But they would be, as he's in a horizontal position, uh, perhaps falling after being struck in the hip. That's right. Uh, let's uh, show exhibit 86, please. I'll ask you to pause it. Pause. Doctor, did you see that large amount of smoke that was emitted from the gun? Yes. Now, with that amount of smoke out of an AR-15, would that impact how far the stippling may occur? Would the smoke impact? The, the, the large amount of smoke. Would the stippling go further out than the four feet? 
No, I don't think there's there's not a relationship there. Uh, the, the stippling is the gunpowder particles that are flying through the air and dispersing as they travel. Um, the, the smoke is the smoke and soot uh, from the barrel of the gun. Does the amount of gunpowder matter in the stippling? Oh, well, withdrawal? yes. It, oh. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say it, it, it does. I mean, you know, there's uh, the number of gunpowder particles that leave the barrel of the gun are not predictable, certainly, but, uh, but they will you know, travel in a, in a dense group and then disperse as they get farther away with more and more falling, falling to the side until uh, none have the energy to create stippling to the skin. Now, when you see that large puff of smoke, uh, you said that would be, that, that is what would potentially leave soot on an individual? Uh, my, my presumption is that soot, that puff was the, the smoke and soot from the end of the gun. So with that large amount of soot, would it be possible to uh, deposit soot further out than just a few inches? I don't know if I can answer that question. I, again, you know, test firing the weapon, you might be able to derive more information, but certainly uh, so it's not very aerodynamic. It doesn't travel very far. Now, Attorney Richards did a demonstration of, with you where he stood about four feet away and talked about the intermediate range. Now, we're... Um, and talking about intermediate range, you're talking about feet from the barrel of the gun, not from the shooter? Correct. Uh, to be specific, the injuries that we're talking about are from the barrel of the gun to the surface yeah, that they make impact with, so the surface of the body in this case. And you haven't seen the actual weapon in this case, have you? No, I have not. Detective Trevi to point the gun at me. Check it again. Yeah. Check it again. Don't need. So if he was to point the gun at me, I'd have to be four feet from the barrel of this gun or one to, one to four feet to generate the stippling you're talking about? Inside of four feet, like I said, that's, that's an outside number. Is that approximately where I would be right now? Um, it's about four feet, maybe a little closer. I, I'll get a ruler, but that's more than four feet. Uh, it would be my impression that is a greater distance than four feet. It's, well, I'm not bad at distances. Is this four feet, approximately? Uh, it, it, it's a little hard to tell, but you're, you're closer. It's, you're, Probably about four feet there. More, more than one of my arm's lengths, anyway? More than one of your arm's length. Thank you. Request? So it is within six inches, correct? The soot steep stippling? Oh, the soot. Uh, the, yeah, the soot is within inches. The intermediate gunpowder stippling is within four feet. Uh, approximately, yes. And if the first shot is... This is the barrel of the gun. 
and the zero shot is the first shot. And somewhere from, and, and I'm not as good as, or as bad, and I don't know, but let's say this is about four feet from the barrel of the gun. It's a little for, farther than four feet, I guess. Okay, so I'm even a little bit further. But from the furthest he is would be four feet. He could have been as close as here with the first shot, correct? Uh, possibly, but the the density of the of the uh, gunpowder stippling is it's pretty spread out, so I think it's a little further away. And, I, and I'm using my right hand because I'm moving down. Uh, you know these gloves got into court here about ten years ago, and. Um, I understand there are appropriate times to use them, but not everything that... I, I don't know why I'm using it. I don't know why you're putting a glove on, to okay. be honest with you. You're not going to get the cooties from that. Yeah, okay. I, I agree. All right. These are bigger. So here, well, what difference does it make? It's, it's the it's, end of the gun, <laughs> touching with my left hand like this. The heavy soot is right here. Well, you're, you're with the right hand, but... Um, but yeah, I. The heavy, see, then I gotta go to the other side. Yeah, you have Jury. to turn around. Can you, can you switch with me? So if it's the left hand, we're gonna go like right. Can you see this, Doctor? You actually have to f turn your hand over. Over? And like this? No. Nope. Go the opposite direction, like this. Like. There you go. Okay. And you would then come in. Approximately That's the entry point to the hand, yes. Exiting where I'm pointing the plane. Correct. And the reason there's no substitute here is because it's past where the fire comes up. Uh, I can only say that there's no soot there. Okay. There's no okay. I know these if people are here for news purposes, the photographers. But I actually think for purposes of the record, I'd like them to come up and get a closer shot. Am I positioning my hand correct? I believe so. It would be more like this because the exit will be right here as I point to. Yes. Just so the record's clear, my hand is touching the end of the barrel. Your hand is now touching the barrel. Okay. And if my hand were in front of the barrel, there would be soot here. And I'm pointing now to, what would you call this part of the I would call it the uh, call it the outside of the pinky finger, so that it's understandable. The outside of the pinky finger, if my hand was in front of the barrel, the, the heaviest soot would be in that location, correct? Uh, you would expect soot in that location. And you know, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but some of the jurors I, I don't think are able to see, so let's uh, you got your shot. So um, and uh, you go ahead. The pinky finger, once again, illustrating the side of my hand. If it was in front of the barrel, as it's now depicted, the heaviest soot would be here. You would expect some soot on that side of the hand. Okay. And, there's, and I didn't see any. I don't know. Would you send uh, copies of, your, of those photos? Send copies of those photos to the clerk, please. Send copies of those photos to the clerk. Thank you. If I am approaching the detective and I am struck in my hip, fracturing my hip, that I would fall, reach out with my hand and try to knock the gun away. That's a possibility. Um, and am I positioning my hand correctly with the evidence? Your hand is, you, you put 
put your hand over like this. Well, just just in a position so that the that the the soot is on the palmer surface. Like this. Like this. So if you go in and you. So the entrance wound is here. No, the entrance wound is on the palmer surface, the under surface. So if you do it, you know, Superman, and then <laughs> and then turn your hand a little bit like this, you can put it in a position that it. There you go. This. Like that. So, what you're saying is consistent with being shot here, momentum carry forward, and swiping at the gut. Now, be consistent with the injuries you found. Those scenarios are, are possible. Well, my hand is positioned correctly to create the injuries that you found. That's the position that the hand has to be in. And then the bullet would have traveled down and potentially kicked up some bullet fragments and concrete hit my leg. That's what I think happened. And then I would have continued down and then the shot to the head and the mid back would have occurred as, a, as I was falling down. As you were more horizontal to the ground, yes. Thank you. Nothing further. Doctor, when you get shot the first time, you're, that doesn't cause you to go forward, correct? It, it shouldn't cause you to go forward, backward, or okay. anything. So he already, Mr. Rosenbaum, already had to have forward momentum at a force to go from the zero shot to the second shot in 2.26 hundredths of a second to be in contact or right on top of that bird, correct? Yes, he had forward momentum. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Doctor. You may step down. Um, let's uh, break for lunch. Uh, it it uh, has just arrived, I think, and uh, we'll take uh, until uh, around 12:30. Uh, any questions? Okay, please don't uh, talk about the case. Uh, read, uh, watch, or listen to any account. See you later. On occasion, I when things don't, they're, they're not going to show up well in the in the in the record. I'll either myself or have one of the parties take a picture. So we have experts to do it today, and the price was right. Mark, uh, send them to uh, Mrs. Uh, yeah. Well, Your Honor, I do want to uh, indicate on the record now that uh, the state intends to rest. Um, I, we've had some discussions regarding the testimony of Brandon Craven. Uh, my understanding from the defense is, is uh, that we, I think there's an agreement that essentially the court will just uh, inform the jury that his testimony should be disregarded, and we're not going to go back into that. 
stricken. stricken. Okay. Right. Fair um, so I don't know when we want to address any motions outside the presence of the jury, but I, that's what, what I intend to do when we return. Okay. Are there going to be any motions? Little. Huh? One. Okay. Okay. Once well, they officially rest, that's what's happened. Yeah. Go ahead. Do we need to go over a criminal records for any witnesses? Yeah, I think we do. Um, Your Honor, I'll tell you what it is. I'm not trying to hide from the court. They have not put in any evidence regarding a lawful order for a curfew violation. We'll be moving to dismiss that. We'll be re um, renewing our objection to the count six, but the court has already ruled just so it's not waived. I think then we're ready to go. Um, all right. Um, yes, to the next seventh count, did you want to address that, that there's no evidence on the that testimony from the detective that a curfew was in place. It's not a lawful order. Uh, the detect did, he, did he testify as to by whom the order had been issued? No. no. Uh, I don't know about that one. Um, yeah, I, uh, I would expect that there would have to be a, just the mere statement that a detective said that there was a curfew in effect doesn't really satisfy the the burden of proof. I will permit you to reopen the evidence, however. No, 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 I don't want to. This is, this is, well, I'm, I'm pretty per. You just said he closed, that's why I brought it No, 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 no. You, know, but, you, know, you, know, I, I, you know what, there are some judges, I, when I went to judges training years ago, this was back a long time ago, right, right after I came on the bench, I sat down with some judges, and one was from Madison, and was testifying about this. She didn't know what to do because she had just, she's got the pending burglary case, a burglary case, and she says they didn't prove that the uh, uh, city of, I'm going to say Middleton, but maybe it was Madison, one of the two, didn't prove that it was in Dane County, and she didn't know whether to grant the motion to dismiss or not. And I didn't say anything, but I thought to myself, you've got to be kidding me. This is here, we're here to get to the truth of things. And I don't want to mess around with um, with uh, an error in presentation of that magnitude, or what's the opposite of magnitude? That he didn't have the authority in another court to issue that order. Uh, that is another issue. So actually, the easy course would be to grant your motion. So I won't have to enter the thicket that the other judge did. But um, um, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take this I weighty matter under advisement. Yeah, I know it. I know it. Um, I'm not going to dismiss it on the ground that it wasn't proved. Whether I grant it on the basis that uh, Judge Russell did is another matter. Um, I'll have to take a look at that, and then. I'd like you to submit in the next day proposed instructions modified version of 2176 with the, because I, I, I Mr. Cross did a nice job on the brief and reported what the instructions committee said. And so I'd like uh, uh, both sides to submit proposed instructions on 2176. Okay? Yeah. Very good. All right, enjoy your lunch.
testimony of uh, witness. Appears to be, Judge. Um, our first witness is uh, Nicholas Smith. Um, Mr. Binger has informed me that, and I'll, I guess I can let him tell you this, but that he has two juvenile adjudications. Um, the year, can you tell me the years, time? They're both from April 30, 2014, here in Kenosha. So I, I don't know how last how old was, the, was he at the time? He would have been 16. Now 23. Um, <clears throat> hand me the. Uh, there have been other criminal cases since then. Um, there were three or four pending criminal cases that were resolved with pleas uh, to one to disorderly conduct and one to violation of a temporary restraining order. That was from April of 2016. And then in May of this year, both of those uh, adult convictions were expunged. Um, okay, well, those are not going to count. I, I understand that, but they're... The, I understand your point that it shows a, a persistent a lawless behavior. Um, give me the... Uh, I guess I could... I, I, I guess I have the ability to look at it. I can give you the case numbers if you like. 14JV36. JV 36. Fourteen JV one oh one.
Um, did you want to say anything? I'm going to count it as two. So the question is, have you ever been adjudicated? Delinquent, not convicted of a crime, right? Right. Okay. All right. Just so, do you understand that, Mr. Smith? Okay. And that's the only thing you answer is that number? Okay, ready to go? I am ready. Okay. Form the arrest in front of the jury first. Yeah, please do. Uh, would you come down, please? Yes. All right, um, you may be seated. Um, welcome back, and a um, couple of things. Uh, first off, the um, um, there was testimony given by um, Brandon Kramen, <clears throat> an employee of the FBI, which was incomplete, it was interrupted, and um, because it was interrupted, it wasn't heard in full, and for that reason, uh, I'm going to strike all of that testimony, and you must disregard that entirely. Any question about that? Okay, uh, number two, um, the seventh count of the information uh, accused the defendant of violation of a curfew, and that case is no longer part of the action here. So the information remains with six in it, and I'll instruct you to the close of the case. But the seventh count of curfew violation is no longer part of the contest here. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Binger. Your Honor, um, the state formally rests its case. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Sarafasi, the defense. Yes, Your Honor. We would call Nicholas Smith. Raise your right hand. Do you sign this the testimony about to give in this matter be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guys? Can we be seated? Sir, will you please state your name and spell it uh, slowly for Madam Nicholas Reporter. Smith, N I C H O L A S Smith, S M I T T H. And Mr. Smith, um, I'm not looking for your specific physical address, but where do you live? Here in Kenosha. And how old are you right now? 23. Have you um, ever been judic adjudicated delinquent in the past? Yes, I believe. How many times? What does that mean? Can you clarify what that means? Of, of how many offenses were you adjudged in juvenile delinquent? One, I believe, as a delinquent. If I told you it was two? It might be. Okay. Now, are you currently employed, sir? Yes. Um, and what kind of work do you do? I work at a factory. Right. And um, if I could, uh, have you, are you familiar with uh, a business called CarSource? Yes, I am. 
And how are you familiar with that business? I worked for them. You worked for them? Yes, I worked for CarSource, and my, I've known the owners for 10 years. And who are the owners? Um, Sam, Sal, uh, their dad, their mom, and their... Uh. And it, do you remember when you worked for them specifically? 2018 to 2019. So you worked for them 2018 to 2019, but you've known them for about a decade? Close to a decade, yes. And what I want to do, if I can, is um, uh, direct your attention to uh, August 24th of 2020. Okay? Okay. Uh, so that would be the day prior to the shootings involving Mr. Rittenhouse. Yes. On that day, uh, did you have any contact at all with anybody from CarSource? Yes, I did. And who was that contact with? Sam. Okay. Can you explain to the jury what that contact was? Uh, the night of the 24th, uh, I received a phone call from Sam stating that his uh, car doctor was on fire and asked if we could do anything. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you. So I'm going to show you, we've heard this at length here, but um, if I said to you the car doctor has been previously pointed out as this car source right here between 59th and 60th, is that fair? Correct. Okay, and that is uh, what is commonly known to you as the car doctor? Correct. All right, and you had said that Sam had asked you for your assistance. Me and one other. Do you know? Do you have? Do you know who that was? I thought one other person. Yeah. Yes, that was Justin Hamilton. And it, to your knowledge, did Mr. Hamilton had he worked for CarSource in the past? For ten years, yes. And on the twenty fourth, what was? Uh, what were you asked to do? Sam had asked if we could uh, do anything about the fires. Asked both of us. And did you? Yes. Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what you did? Um, approximately around 9 o'clock, I had received a phone call from Sam stating that car doctor was on fire and asked if we could do anything. And then not too long after, I received a phone call from Justin stating that he was going to car doctor to put out the fires. Um, when they arrived, Justin and his son, Austin, who was a previous employer for car source as well, um, when they arrived, uh, we called Sam, and Sam had said that the body shop door, garage door, was unlocked and to gain entry so that we could access the power washers and the buckets with inside the car source so that we could put out the fires. So was Sam, uh, he wasn't down there with you, is that fair? No, he was not. Okay. He just had given you guys information as to what he was hoping that you would do? Correct. And the information as to... Um, well, I'll ask it to you this way. Was the car doctor building locked? No. The front door was, but the back door was not. The body shop door. And did you gain access then to the, to the shop? Correct. He gave us permission. And what did you do upon gaining? Uh, we turned on the lights inside the building so that we could uh, locate the uh, power washer and all the buckets. And we proceeded to unlock the front door and put out the fires and we had numerous amounts of uh, bystanders help us as well that were also helping us put out the fires. Now on the 24th, was there anybody there um, physically protecting the business? No. And when you got there, what was the condition, I'll ask you, were there fires going on at that point? Or yes. Not? And that was at the, the car doctor location? Correct. So were you able then to combat the fires, deal with those fires? Correct. Okay. Um, at any point on the 24th, did you see um, anybody associated with car source or car doctor down there? Uh, in the morning of the 24th, yes. Morning of the 24th or the 25th? Not at that night, no, I did not. The morning of the 25th, I did. Okay, Sorry. so, okay, so 24th, 
You're putting out the fires. Correct. You then go home at some point? Correct. What time do you think you left the car, doctor? Just 1 a.m. Around 1 a.m. Anywhere between 12 a.m. and 2 a.m. Now if I can ask you about the 25th. Um, on the 25th, do you have any contact with anybody from Car Source? Yes, I do. And who is that? Sam. And how do you have contact with Sam? He calls me in the morning of the 25th asking if I could provide assistance to watch over the building later in that night. He called me and uh, Justin Hamilton. So at that point, he's not asking you to, if I have this right, he's not asking you to put out fires. He's asking for help protecting the business. Is that what Correct. he said? And how do you respond to that? I say yes. I can, I can help him. I can watch over the building. And have you at that point kind of formulated a plan on what you're going to do? Yes. And what's that plan? Um, I had called my other friends that who also had previously worked there, and our plan was we were going to set up on the roof and stay there most of the night watching the building. And when you say that you had talked to your, or were planning on talking to your friends, who were they? Austin Hamilton, Colin Doherty, and Justin Hamilton. And did you uh, have contact with those people at some point on the 25th? Correct. Uh, can you, I'll ask you this way. What time did you get the call from Sam? Early in the morning, anywhere between 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Not 10 p.m., 10 a.m. And what time do you think you had... Um, contact with or spoke to uh, the Hamiltons, the people that you were talking about? Uh, around 11 a.m. They, they first called me, and then I called Colin, and that was so around 11 a.m. So after 11 a.m., you is it fair to say that you believe you have like a plan in your head and people to help you with that plan? Correct. Um, after 11 a.m., um, is there anything else or is there something that happens uh, that puts you in contact with anybody else that ends up there that night? Yes. And who is that? Dominic Black. And can you tell the jury what that contact with Mr. Black was? I had noticed uh, Dominic Black around the afternoon, 3 or 4 p.m. Uh, he was downtown and I needed somebody to give me a ride to go buy some body armor because I had not planned on being armed that night. Um, and he said he would give me a ride, and Kyle was with him. Uh, they came to my house around 4 p.m., 3 or 4 p.m. in that afternoon, picked me up, and I do not remember exactly what transpired after that, but I ended up, uh, Kyle ended up lending me his body armor and dropping me off, and they asked where I was going. Okay, I'm gonna slow you down for a second. Correct. Okay, so um, you had said that you saw a Snapchat. Correct. I'm not familiar with Snapchat, but so it's like a video or something? Yes, correct. I saw a Snapchat video of Dominic downtown, and Kenosha. And you then, from that Snapchat, reached back out to him? Correct. I reached out to Dominic. And you had mentioned that you were looking for or wanted uh, some, some body armor, right? Correct. And that, you tell me what you wanted that for. I had not planned on being armed, and I wanted a means of protecting myself, and body armor was the next best suit for it. Now, you had said that you didn't plan on being armed. Um, was there a particular reason that you didn't plan on being armed? We planned on being on the roof, and I see no reason that I was going to need a, to be armed. Based on your location? Correct. We were going to be on the roof. I did and not see, foresee myself needing a firearm or having any confrontation with anyone needing to have a firearm. And you had said that, if I have it right, that um, Kyle Rittenhouse then had offered you his body armor. Correct. So did you accept that? Yes, I did. So to your now, and if you know, Mr. did Mr. Rittenhouse say anything that would lead you to believe that he had another, like he had two sets of body armor or anything else? No, he did not. So what time, so you go down to CarSource, right? 
Correct. And who do you go there with on the 25th? Myself at first, and then I end up meeting Kyle and Dominic there after I left my house about 15 minutes. I had arrived at Car Source, and they met me there within 10, 15 minutes of being there. And was that a, a, a planned kind of location meeting? Yes. Um, were you aware whether or not Mr. Rittenhouse and or Mr. Black had spoken to anybody from Car Source earlier that morning? I was not aware. So you, if I have this right, you're there about four o'clock. I arrived there, I would say five o'clock. We went to go get uh, the body armor around four o'clock. So you, and which car source do you arrive at? Uh, 59th Street location, car doctor. And you said shortly thereafter, uh, Mr. Rittenhouse and Mr. Black arrive? Correct. And what do you do, what happens then? I meet with the owner of uh, car source, Sam, and tell him what's gonna be going on. Okay, so at about five-ish on yeah. the 25th, you have contact with the person you know to be Sam? Correct. And he, that is at the 59th Street car doctor location? Correct. And when you get there and you see Sam, what does he do? Uh, gives me a hug and tells me thank you for coming. He didn't tell you at any point to get off that property? No, he did not. He didn't tell you that you were trespassing or anything like that? No, he did not. Was there any conversation that you had with Sam uh, relating to any, any type of payment or were you doing this for free or how was this gonna happen? When I had arrived at the location, uh, he said he would throw, throw me some money to split between the guys that were helping us. And did he ever do that? No, he did not. So you, you hug Sam, you, you talk to him for a little bit. Does he, what does he do, if anything, in terms of kind of helping you guys with buildings and things like that? Getting into buildings, anything like that? He uh, gives me a set of keys to the 59th Street location. So that's the car doctor location? Car doctor, yes, correct. Okay. So he hands you a set of keys so you can go in? Correct. Well, he had actually, um, we talked briefly, and then he said he was actually heading home, uh, and that his brother Sal uh, would give us a ride over to the 63rd Street location because he was locking up, and that his brother Sal would give me the keys. And did you end up meeting up with his brother Sal? Correct. His brother was there. And did his brother Sal then give you the keys? Correct. You had testified that there was a plan that you had a plan to be on the roof of that building. Correct. How were you planning on getting up there? A ladder. And where was, if you know, well, how did you know that you, there was a ladder there? Uh, I had previously worked there and knew there were ladders and Sam had also showed me where the ladders were at the car doctor. And when you say Sam showed you where the ladders were, do you mean on the 25th? Yes, correct. So you then make contact with Sal. Correct. And are there other people there to help uh, you protect the car doctor? Not at the moment. Uh, when we had arrived at the 63rd Street location, we'd stood around for about 10 minutes, and that's when uh, another group of individuals in their cars had pulled up and asked if we needed any assistance that night. And what did you say? I said if they want to, we'd appreciate it. Okay. Uh, did you know who they were before they got there? No, I did not. Do you know the names of any of those people today? I know one of the names. And who is that? Ryan Belch. And to be fair, um, at the 59th Street car source, Dominic Black is armed, is that right? Correct. And Mr. Rittenhouse is armed as well? Correct. Mr. Bulch? Correct. Okay. So how long are you at the car source, car doctor, before Sal leaves? We were not at car doctor when these people arrived. We were, he gave us a ride from car doctor to the 63rd Street location, and that's where we met these people. And then- Sa Okay, hold on. 
Sale gave who a ride? Me, Dominic, and Kyle. We okay. were waiting for uh, Justin, Colin, and Austin to get there. And Sale, do you remember the car he gave you? I don't not, Do you remember the make of car he gave you a ride in? It was either a Mercedes or a BMW. And you went from 63rd down to 59th? No, 59th to 63rd. Now, there has been, uh, this jury has seen a photograph. Correct. Where was that photograph taken? 63rd. Okay. Yes, I am. And which one of those people is you? I'm the one wearing the red cross on the uh, helmet, the white helmet. Okay, so you're fourth from the right? Correct. Okay, and there's been testimony that the guy on the far left is Sal, is that right? That is correct. Okay. Um, after that photo is taken, does Sal ever tell you? I want you to leave here. I don't want you here. You're causing problems. Anything? Does he say anything that no. would indicate he doesn't want your presence? No. He was very grateful for our presence. So what happens after Sal leaves? Can you tell me where everybody goes, if you know? Yes. Um, actually, shortly before, shortly after Sam had left, uh, another group of Latino Americans had arrived in the parking lot with uh, melee weapons. At telling us that they could watch that location for us for that night, and after that we had made our uh, we walked down to 59th Street location to meet up with Austin, Justin, and Colin. And when you get to the 59th Street location, uh, who's with you? Um, Ryan Belsh, two of his friends. It was either two or three of his friends: uh, Colin, Dominic, Kyle, Justin, and Austin. And are there, for lack of a better term, kind of uh, locations that people are going to kind of be at for the night? Correct. And what is your what is your location going to be? The roof. And if only if you know, do you know what Kyle's location is going to be? Did not state where he was going to be. I'll ask it to you this way: Was he on the roof with you? No. Um. At some point, when you're on the roof, do the protesters, rioters, whatever, do they move? Are they starting to move south down Sheridan Road? That is correct. And about what time is that? They had previously done it before I went on the roof as well. Okay. Um, around, I would say, 8.30. And at that point, are you on the roof? I am not on the roof at that point, no. Once they, once they start moving south on Sheridan, do you take a position on the roof? After they dissipate within 10 minutes, I do take position on the roof, yes. And while you're on the roof, um, does anything happen to you? Uh, yes, our group, we get uh, chemical bombed from the protesters. And when you say chemical bombed, can you just explain kind of what you believe that means? Um, I believe it was an ammonia and bleach bomb. They, they made inside of a plastic bottle and threw it up on the roof. Now, to be fair, you didn't see who did that, right? No, I did not see who did that. And anything else that was happening to you while you were on the roof other than the ammonium? Bricks. They were throwing bricks at us. And again, to be fair, you're not sure who that was. No, I am not. You um, might not have known that night, but there was a gentleman there by the name of uh, Joseph Rosenbaum. Correct. That night, did you see him? No, I did not. I was not paying attention. So there was uh, no contact between you and Mr. Rosenbaum? No, there was not. Did you see um, Mr. Mr. Rittenhouse that evening? Yes, I did. And can you describe uh, what, if anything, you noticed that he was doing? Uh, he was standing in the parking lot. Okay. There's been testimony about him repeatedly yelling medic, medic, medic throughout the evening. Did you ever see him do anything uh, as it relates to being a medic? Um, I do not know. I was not paying attention. Okay. Do you have any medical training? Some. Okay. Um, is that in part the reason for the 
Correct. On the hat. And can you just briefly tell us a little bit about your medical training? Uh, my brother, who was an infantryman in the Marine Corps, has taught me CLS, Combat Life Saving, which is... Yes, ma'am. Um, my brother, who was in the infantry, was in the infantry in the Marine Corps, had taught me uh, CLS, Combat Life Saving, and taught me briefly on what to do with gunshot wounds, uh, lacerations, and things like that. Was there any, at any point that evening, sir, did you um, become armed? Yes, I did. And when was that? When the first crowd had uh, pushed towards us, when the police had pushed the first crowd down Sheridan Road, uh, Ryan Belch handed me off his pistol and said, just in case. And did you feel at that point that it was necessary or not? Yes and no. Okay. Um, explain it. Yes, because there was a massive amount of people. I would say anywhere between 150 to 250 people. No, because I didn't see any need to have any I had non-lethal. Uh, was your location a factor in that at all? Yes, it was. I was on the ground at that point. Okay. Um, did you then move back up to the roof? I had not moved up to the roof yet. That was when I had moved up to the roof. Uh, when the crowd had engaged us, not engaged us, uh, pushed towards us, we uh, the people that were going to be on the roof had, at that time, figured this is a good time to go on the roof because the crowd had dissipated and pushed themselves back towards the courthouse. And that's when we went on the roof. And do you, um, when you're on the roof, uh, there's been videos shown. Uh, do you see uh, Kyle Rittenhouse at any point after you go back up on the roof? On the roof? Um, a couple times throughout the night I see him walking around. Okay, so you see him, if this is fair, has he left your location and is he moving from location to location? Correct. At some point that evening then, do you hear what you believe to be gunshots? That is correct. Right, and when you hear those, where are you? I am on the roof. And so, to be fair, you don't see what had happened, is that right? No, I do not. And there has been testimony regarding two instances, one involving Mr. Rosenbaum, the other involving Mr. Huber uh, and Mr. Grosskreutz. Do you see either one of those happenings? No, I do not. Is there a time, well, let me ask you this. When, when you hear the shooting, do you get off the roof? I get off the roof uh, because Dominic had received a phone call at the time I had not known we received a phone call from, and he had stated that we have to leave. It is getting uh, hectic. And the prior events that just occurred, gunshots, um, we all concluded that that was safe bet, that it was getting crazy, so we'd all, everybody that was on the roof had now got off the roof. So when you get off the roof, do you see Kyle Rittenhouse? Yes, I do. And where do you see him? Inside the shops and down. And how does he look to you? Um, sweating, pale. Does he say anything? Uh, he repeats, uh, I just shot someone over and over. And I believe at some point he did say he had to shoot someone. Um, what happens then? I tell him to walk outside and turn himself in. That was a safe bet for him. And I told him to walk outside and he had said, I had to, I had to shoot someone. And at that point I'd left the location because I was in fear that the protesters were going to come to that location. Okay, one moment. Mr. Smith, I don't have any other questions for you. Thank you for your time. May I proceed, Your Honor? Right. Mr. Smith, you have actually two juvenile adjudications for uh, violations of the law, correct? I believe so, yes. On April 30th, 2000. No, 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 no. Um, 
His answer was, I might. He didn't answer correctly. I, I don't think we conducted the usual discussion prior, and uh, we didn't. And um, I explicitly said two, and I don't know what happened, but the matter is covered. Move on to something else. So, Mr. Smith, you indicated that you met up with the defendant and Dominic Black and borrowed the defendant's body armor. Is that right? That is correct. Can you describe that for us, please? What the is body that? armor? Yes. Uh, it's a plate carrier. It's a vest. Um, yeah, a vest. So it's not like a suit vest. No, it is not. It's like an armor vest that you would see somebody in the military wearing. What is it made out of? Um, I cannot, I do not know, but it does have uh, body armor inside it, uh, soft armor panels. Do you know what it is designed to stop? Or bullets. Protect? What kind of bullets? Um, it was 3A, so 357, anything up to 357. A 357 is a caliber that's typically seen in handguns, correct? That is correct. This is not the type of body armor that would stop a rifle, correct? That is correct. You're familiar with the AR-15s that the defendant and Dominic Black had, correct? That is correct. Have you ever shot or used one of those? In the past, yes, I have. Those typically fire 223 or 556 caliber, is that right? That is correct. And that's the type of caliber that would go through your your vest. That is correct. Where physically in the world did you go with the defendant to pick up that body armor on Tuesday, August 25th? I do not recall where I went. I know that I'm pretty sure we left to go to my bank to pull out money. Um, I do not remember what transpires afterwards, but Kyle does end up giving me his body armor because we never went and got mine. I do not remember why or what transpired to why I did not, we did not go and get it. But Kyle does end up giving me his body armor. If I understood your testimony correctly, Dominic Black and the defendant came to pick you up that day. Is that right? That is correct. And I'm not going to ask you your address, but you live relatively within walking distance of this area, correct? That is correct. And they didn't pick you up to drive you to this area. They drove you someplace west or south of here, correct? I do not remember. When they came to pick you up, whose vehicle were they driving? Dominic's. Was the plate carrier body armor already in the vehicle? Yes, it was. From the defendant? That is correct, the defendant's body armor. And you said that you chose not to have a gun that night because you felt the body armor would be sufficient protection. Is that fair to say? That is correct. What were you worried about? Um, the way the previous nights of what I'd seen, I was worried somebody was going to shoot me or anything. You know, I just wanted a means of protection. What had you seen on the previous night that made you feel that while you were protecting a business here in Kenosha, someone was going to shoot you? A lot of individuals armed with rifles and pistols and acting irate throughout the nights. Did you see or hear of anyone who actually shot anyone on those prior nights? No, I did not. But it's fair to say that when you came downtown on Tuesday, August 25th, you were concerned about the potential of violence, correct? That is correct. You were particularly concerned that that violence would come from the people on the street, the protesters, demonstrators, whatever word you want to call them. Is that fair to say? That is correct. You felt that they not only posed a danger to the physical property you were at, but you personally for guarding that property. Is that, that fair is to correct. say? 
When is the last time before August 25th, 2020, that you worked for Sal or Sam or any member of their family? 2019. I want to make sure we're very precise about the properties that we're talking about. Um, you've got a map there behind you, and I'm going to represent to you, Mr. Smith, that there is a location uh, that is marked car source that is on the northeast corner of 59th Street and Sheridan Road. Do you see that labeled car source? Yes, I do. Would you agree with me that that location is properly called car source? The dealership or the mechanic shop? The one that's on the northeast corner. I have a laser pointer if that would help. Yes, it would. I'm talking about this location here. Yes, that is uh, labeled car source. And is that the proper name of it? Yes, sir. There is another location that is on the southwest corner of that intersection. Do you see where I'm pointing? Yes, I do. It is labeled on that map car source. Is that accurate? Yes, and no, they use two different names. What is the other name they use? Car doctor. When we're talking, if it's helpful, if it's okay with you, can we refer to that as car doctor? Yes. Okay. And to be clear, that is the location, car doctor, where you spent almost the entire evening uh, on the, and mostly on the roof, fair to say? Correct. There is a third location at the corner of 63rd and Sheridan that is also marked car source on that map. Is that accurate to call that car source? Yes. Okay. Is it correct to say that your plan personally that night was to guard the car doctor location? That is correct. Had you mentioned you had last worked for these folks about a year before this, fair to say? Correct. Had you ever worked at that car doctor location? Correct. Were you familiar with the things that had been inside the building when you last worked there? Yes. When you were there on Tuesday night, August 25th, did it appear that some of the property inside had already been moved out of there? Some of it, yes, but so not all of it. A lot of the mechanics, tools, and diagnostic equipment, things like that? Mm, not a lot of it. There were still uh, actual mechanic benches still in there, the actual rolling benches. So those were still in there. I don't know if they were possessed any tools inside them, but there were, from my knowledge, tools still inside the building. And I tell me if I'm wrong, but when that location was being used to do mechanic work or detailing or whatever would be done, there would typically be cars that needed to be worked on that were parked in the lot. Is that right? Correct. On the night of August 25th, those cars had already been moved out of there. Fair to say? Some of them. And the 63rd Street location, the one farther south, that also normally would be a lot that would be full of cars to be sold. Fair to say? That is correct. And when you were there on Tuesday night, August 25th, those cars had all been moved out. Not correct? all of them, no. You indicated that on the night of August 24th, you were helping to put out fires. Is that right? That is correct. Was that at the car doctor location? Yes, it was. Where were the fires? In the parking lot right next to it. Were they cars that were on fire? Yes, they were. Not the building itself? No. And you said that on that particular night, none of the owners of the company were physically there helping to put out the fires. Is that right? Yes, it is. So they were relying on you and, and other folks to do their work for them? Correct. Similarly, the next day when you spoke to Sam or Sal or both of them, the plan was you were going to guard the property or be there at the property and those owners weren't going to be there anymore, right? That is correct. They were going to pay you a couple hundred dollars? That's that is correct? Right? And you never got any of that money? No, I did not. You indicated that your personal plan 
at the car doctor location was to spend the time up on the roof. Is that right? That is right. And you didn't feel you needed a gun up on the roof. Is that right? That is correct. I did not. How were you going to protect the building from the roof? I had multiple other friends there with uh, rifles. So they were the ones? Correct. Who were going to be protecting it with their rifles? Correct. I was providing overwatch. What does that mean? I was watching the building. Over, I was watching the building from the roof, making sure that nobody went inside or damaged the property. Uh, the building. The cars were burnt, so we didn't care about the cars. So whatever cars were left on that lot were a lost cause? All of them. You were worried about the structure? Correct. That entire night, there was no damage to that structure? That is structure. correct. No fire, correct? Correct. No stolen machinery or equipment, correct? Correct. You said that you didn't see any reason why you would need to confront anyone with a gun that night. Is that correct? That is correct. Is that because you didn't feel that using a gun to protect a building was appropriate? Yes and no. Um, it was appropriate in the needs when the situation would arise, but at the moment throughout the nights that I'd previously seen was not required. What sort of situation would arise with regard to that car doctor building where you would feel it would, it would have been appropriate to use a gun? judgment what he would consider appropriate for him might be a, a, a different judgment than another person could lawfully reach was there ever a time on the night of August 25th where you saw a situation with regard to the car doctor building that you felt it was necessary to use a gun no You were shown a photograph that was taken uh, of you earlier in that evening. Were you wearing the body armor in that picture? Yes, I was. Can we put that picture up back again, please? That's exhibit number six, uh, number 30. So, Mr. Smith, you are the individual wearing the white hat with the red cross on it, is that right? That is correct. What does that hat mean? Oh, sorry. Um, where's the... Oh, okay, good, thank you. Okay, cool. Okay, so you have this white hat with the red cross on. What does that mean? First aid. Was that your way of letting everyone know that you were there to treat people that had a medical situation? Yes. Did you ever treat anyone? No, I did not. So help me understand, why wear a hat telling people that you're there to help when you're up on the roof and can't? Provide an aid for my guys up on the roof. So your intent was to let the three or four other people that were gonna join you on the roof know that if they needed help, you were there for them. Correct. Did you have medical supplies with you? Yes, I did. What kind of medical supplies did you have? Uh, I had what's called an IFAC, an individual first aid kit, which has chest uh, seals, clotting powder, um, tourniquet, and uh, that's about it. A couple other medical supplies, gauze. Did you ever have to use any of that? Uh, no, I did not. So it's fair to say that despite the chemical bomb, the bricks, and whatever else was going on at the car doctor location, no one in your group got injured? No. Is that fair to say? It is fair to say, yes. You indicated that once you got up on the roof, you really weren't aware of where the defendant went the rest of the evening. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say, yes. You were asked earlier, about Joseph Rosenbaum. And I just want to be clear, 
as you sit here today, a year after all this happened, you know who Joseph Rosenbaum is. I do know, yes. At the time, that night, had you ever heard that name before? No, I did not. And looking back, do you remember encountering him at all that night? Not at all, no. I'm going to ask you the same questions about Anthony Huber. You know who he is as you sit here today. I do know, yes. On that particular evening, did you have any idea who he was? No. Nope. Did you ever see him as far as you remember? No, I did not. Same thing with Gage Grosskreutz. You know who he is today. Yes, I do today. On that evening, had any idea who he was? No. Nope. Ever remember seeing him? No. Nope. So these rocks or chemical bombs or bricks or whatever was being thrown at you on the roof, you are not here telling us Joseph Rosenbaum was doing that, right? Correct. I could not see who was throwing them. You, and maybe I misheard you, I thought I heard you say at one point that you had non-lethal? Yes, that is correct. What do you mean by that? Pepper spray and a pepper gun. What is a pepper gun? It shoots pepper spray out of it. I just want to make sure I understand. You listed pepper spray and pepper gun. Are those two different things? Um, I believe at the time that I had what they, uh, it had pepper balls in it. I don't think it was actually like pepper gel. It was a pepper ball gun. And that's something that you carried that evening because you could use that to defend yourself if there was a need. Correct. Deter, not defend. Deter somebody. If, if the situation arised, I could deter whoever was coming at me. Okay. Do you mean deter, like scare them off or Correct. ward them away? Correct. Did you ever have to use that? No, I did not. You indicated that after you heard the shootings, the defendant came back, you described what he looked like, and you said he had said he just shot someone and that he had to, correct? Correct. Did he ever say who he shot? No, he did not. Did he ever say how many people he shot? I do not remember. Did he ever say anything about the, the condition, like whether those people were armed? Uh, he did not say anything about them being armed. Did he ever say that they threatened him? I do not remember. Did he ever say he feared for his life? Do not remember. Did he ever say anything about any weapons that he saw on any of the people that he shot? No, I do not remember. And he didn't tell you how many people he shot either? No. I was a little confused by the end of your testimony because on one, uh, in one statement you said you told him to go outside and turn himself in, correct? Correct. But in another statement you said you left because you were fearful the protesters were coming to that location. I left after I told him that. So help me understand, if the protesters are coming, you assume these protesters were coming to harm you or the defendant or members of your group, right? Correct. So putting the defendant outside was going to put him in danger, right? Yes, it would have, yes. If the uh, protesters were coming, yes. Did you know whether they were coming? I did not know whether they were coming or not. From the roof, you could see the line of police cars along 60th of Sheridan, correct? Correct. So you knew the police were there? Correct. In fact, by that time of the evening, the police had pushed all the protesters south of 60th, right? Correct. There, was, there were no more protesters around that car doctor location, correct? Correct. As far as you could tell, there was no more danger to that building, fair? Correct. Why were you still there? Um, to just watch over the building the rest of the night. I mean, the prior nights, uh, a lot of the stuff had died down or so we had thought. Uh, there was fires around 8 o'clock the prior nights, and then later in the night, around 2 a.m. on the first night is when uh, car source got lit on fire at 2 a.m. So you were planning and staying all night? Correct. Up on the roof? Correct. But after the defendant comes back, you leave? Correct. Why? I was in fear that the protesters or the crowd would retaliate or any means, and I, at that point, had deem that building a lost cause. If you didn't know how many people the defendant had shot and you didn't know who they were, why did you assume it was the protesters that were going to be upset with the defendant at that moment? I do not know. You told someone else in your group, Joanne Fiedler, that the police were coming to the building, didn't you? I do not remember.
So you never came back to that location and told Ms. Fiedler that the police were coming to the building. Is that correct? I do not remember. I mean, it's been over a year, so I do not remember. Obviously, if you think the defendant should have turned himself into the police at that moment and the police were coming to that building, you would have wanted him to stay there, correct? Correct. I have nothing further. Redirect. I just have a couple questions for you, Mr. Smith. Um, Mr. Binger had asked you if there was ever, an ending, ever a time that night at the car doctor that you felt it was appropriate or necessary that firearms would be used. Do you remember that? Yes. At any point uh, on the 25th, were you ever at the car doctor, were you ever attacked? I was not. Did anybody ever threaten to kill you at that location? I do not recall, no. Did anybody threaten to kill you to your face? Meaning no. they walked up to you and said, I'm going to kill you? No. Did anybody chase after you that evening? No. I have nothing else. Any question? No. You may step down, sir. Raise your right hand. Do you sign before the testimony about to give this matter be the truth, the whole truth, and the truth, so help you God? I do. You may be seated. Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon, ma'am. Oh, hello. Uh, will you uh, please state your name and spell it for the record? Joanne Fiedler, J O capital A N N, Fiedler, F I E D L E R. And Ms. Fiedler, I don't need to know your specific location of address, but can you give us uh, the city that you live in? West Bend. And um, how old are you, ma'am? How old am I? Yep. Yeah. Sorry. There isn't one, I guess. Sorry. Um, are you employed? Yes. And what do you do? I don't need to know where you work. Just can you tell me what I you work do? in manufacturing. Um, you were, if I'm right, interviewed by the FBI as it relates to. Uh, the incident on August 25th, 2020. Is that right? Correct. Now, if I could ask you, uh, in the summer, prior to August 25th of 2020, um, there's been conversations and testimony about civil unrest throughout the country. Was that something that you were paying attention to? Yes. And can you tell the uh, jury what you were thinking about it, what, if anything, you did about it, things like that. Well, I understood um, when BLM was, wanted to march, we were all with them and everything, but then they started destroying their own communities, and I didn't believe in that. That really struck me hard. And then uh, the 71-year-old business owner that got beat down, that bothered me a lot. Veterans bother me a lot, and the elderly bother me a lot. And, and children, of course, too, but that just didn't sit right with me. And, and you keep hearing everybody always saying, somebody's got to stand up, somebody's got to stand up. So was there anything, based on the, your feelings, that you did in relation to that? Can you repeat that? Sure. Was there anything that you had actually done? Uh, any groups that you started, anything oh, you participated yeah, yeah. in as it relates to um, kind of what you were observing? In yes. Actually, we started a, a patriot group. It's uh, United Citizens for Patriotism. We wanted to show support for the country, um, support for the police, because you know, they were asking to be defunded, um, support for all the emergency workers that were going out there into these riots, uh, cleaning up, firemen, 
So just everybody that serves their country, our community services, and just show support for them. And we just stood out with our flags to let everybody know that, you know, we were thinking of them, we were there for them. We tried to do food drives. Um, we tried to get the fire department involved. Uh, we got the police involved, but everything was limited or they were, weren't able to bring out their trucks to do community things because of COVID. And um, prior to August 25th of 2020, uh, did you know who Kyle Rittenhouse was? No. Uh, had you ever had, to your knowledge, any contact with him whatsoever? No, none. And um, so this, this group that you had talked about, that you had stood out and kind of waved flags, um, were there other people uh, relative or uh, as it relates to this case that were part of that group? Yes, yes. There was uh, Dustin and Danton. Okay. So me and Danton more or less started it with an, another guy in the, in the area. And then just more people came up to see what was going on and just talking to him and what we, you know, what we were standing there for. Uh, we met Dustin that way. Does the name Ryan Bulch mean anything to you? Yeah, he had, he had walked up one day when we were standing, um, I think three weeks or end of July, beginning of August, walked up in his military uniform and started talking to the guys. I didn't really have communication with him at that time, but he was talking to the guys and made friends with them. So if I could then uh, kind of direct your attention to uh, 25th, 24th, 25th of August, um, was there a time then that you had uh, made a decision uh, that you were gonna come to Kenosha? Yes. And when was that, if you know, when was that decision made? Um, just after seeing all the, the violence and the fires going on, um, I just, got a phone call and said, hey, we're going to go down and help protect businesses. Do you want to come along? And what date was that, if you remember? I think it was the 25th, correct? I, I'm not. You tell me. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. It's the 24th or the 25th. Okay. And based on that call that you got, um, was there some kind of plan put in place or some discussion about what you were going to do? Not that I'm aware of. I just know we were driving down. Okay. And who were you driving with? I was driving with Danton Merritts. And were there, so it was just the two of you? Just the two of us to start, yes. Okay. So you said just to start, were there other people that, that are relevant to this case that were part of that? Yes. We met up um, at a park and ride and met um, Dustin and Ryan. And that's Ryan Bulch? Yes. And if you, if you know, at about what time do you think that you met up with them at the park and ride? Uh, five-ish. No. Okay, so five-ish on the 25th? Yes. And did you know of any specific location you were going or plan that was in place on what you were going to do when you got there? I didn't really have the specifics, no. I didn't know of any plan. So to be fair, you drive down with Danton, Mertz. Yes. Where do you go uh, in Kenosha, do you remember? Yeah, we came down um, Sheridan and we wound up at the car, car source on 63rd. And was that just you and Danton or was it, was Ryan Bulch and Dustin also there? With Ryan Bulch and Dustin, they were, they, are, they were in front of us, we were following them. So and they pulled in there. Sorry, and to your knowledge, um, was car store, going to car source just kind of happenstance, meaning was it a plan that was in place, Tino? To me, it was just a happenstance. And when you, about what time do you think you got there? Uh, it had to be at least seven-ish, if I estimate the time, how long it takes to get here. And when you got there, um, who was there? Uh, Nick was there. He had the. Oh, hold on. Nick is Nick Smith. Yes. Did you know Nick Smith before you got there? No. Okay, so you met Nick Smith that day. Yes. Okay, so Nick Smith is there. Yes. Sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, that's okay. Um, I seen him. We got out. Uh, he came up, introduced himself, and then we met. What he, what Nick introduced us to, was the owner of Car Source. Okay, and 
Do you recall that person's name? I didn't. He gave me like the full Indian name. I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to repeat that. I don't recall. Okay. Um, when he entered, when he was introduced to you, did he do anything? Did he just shake your hand? Did he just look at you? What did he do? Oh yeah, he was happy to see us. He was crying. He was thanking us. And I, I even commented, I heard you've had cars that burned down because we did drive by that when we came up to that business. And he, uh, excuse me, he had told us that he had over a hundred cars that were burnt that night. So now, I'm sorry, when you said he was crying, there's various, there's crying, happy crying, sad crying. Do you recall? No, it was sad crying. He was, well, I, I, I don't know if it was sad or happy. I, I know he was happy to see us, but I know he's sad about his under cars, you know, the situation. So, um, Exhibit 30, which is this picture, I just want to make sure there's, you're the, if I'm right, you're the person third from the left. Yes. Is that right? You have the, the white hat on or yes. helmet on? Yes. Okay. And uh, is the person that's on the left of that picture, is that the person who you would say was crying? And is yes, that that is? that's the man that Nick introduced as the owner. And after you were introduced uh, <coughs> to the owner, what happened after that? Did he stay? Did he leave? If you know. He just disappeared. I didn't see where he went. He just disappeared. We parked our cars and just met back there then. Now, is this the location that you met Kyle Rittenhouse at? Yes. And I think you had said um, you had met him before, but was he there when you got there? No. So he showed up after you were already there? Yeah, I believe we actually took two pictures before Kyle showed up. And if you recall um, of those people, who did he show up with, if, if you remember? Uh, Dominic, which I think is on the right of Kyle. The guy that's on the far, far right? Yep. Your far right? Place. Yes. And was there a... So after you take this picture, is there kind of a plan in place on what you all are going to do? Uh, just from what I remember, um, Nick wanted to split us up. He mentioned there was three businesses and he wanted to split us all up and one group go here, one group go there. Did the person on the far left, the owner of the car source, did he ever tell you to leave? Did he ever, did he ever say that to you? No, not at all. Did he ever tell you that you were trespassing and he didn't, he didn't want you there? No, not at all. So you leave and where do you go? Uh, we walked up to the 59th in Sheridan business. It was kind of kitty corner where he had all the cars burnt down the night before. <clears throat> okay, and who, if you recall, went with you? Um, that was Nick and me and Dustin and Danton and Ryan. I think there was another kid in there which I don't recognize and then Kyle and Dominic. Now if you know was there a was there a any discussion about you said that the owner said or somebody said there were three locations was it was there a plan to protect all three were you just assigned to one do you know how that kind of played out? As far as I recall, it was just to protect the one on the 63rd in Sheridan, and the other one was on the 59th in Sheridan. And you went to the 59th? Yes. Um, so when you get to the 59th in Sheridan, are you, are you armed? Yes. Okay. And what, what, do you, what kind of, what are you armed with? I carry a 380 pistol. Okay, so in that picture, is that pistol somewhere on your person? Um, I don't know if it was yet. But you're not disputing that you had one? No, I'm not disputing that at all. Okay. And when you go to the 59th Street car source, where are you located? Meaning, do you, are you, we've heard testimony about people on the roof, people on the ground. Where are you? Oh, I'm on the ground. 
And can you tell us who else is on the ground with you? Um, Kyle, Dustin, Ryan. Yeah, the four of us are on the ground. So how close to you is Mr. Rittenhouse at the 59th Street address? Five, maybe five or 10 feet to my left. So at that location, he's standing near you for at least a portion of the night? Yes. And when you see him at that location and he's with you, um, what, is he, what is he doing, he being Mr. Rittenhouse? To begin with, or? Well, wait, you're, you guys are just there on, the, on 59th uh, as the night is progressing, right? Yeah. Is he doing anything? Is he staying there? Is he leaving the property? What is he doing? No, he was staying there. We were all staying there. Okay. Um, there's been conversations about, and I'll ask you if you look at that picture, there's a, that little orange box in front of him. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Was there any time during that evening that you saw him doing anything other than simply standing there? Oh, yes. Okay. Can you tell us what you saw? Yeah, I'm sorry. He, um, there was other people that did walk by before like the bigger crowd of the protesters came through and he was offering medic services we had a girl walk up that I don't know if she broke her ankle or twisted her ankle that he actually helped bandage her up so she could walk out because her boyfriend had to kind of carry her and when he did that when he was doing that um, did he ever ask you for any assistance in terms of as it relates to his firearm yes and what did he ask you to do he just asked me to hold on to his gun, and I did. So he would take it off, if I'm hearing you right, he would take it off, and then while he was working on whoever had walked by and asked for help? Yes. And... <coughs> that evening, do you remember seeing the man in the front? Yes. Okay, with, I'm talking about the man with the red shirt on. Correct. Okay. Did you know who he was that night? No. You didn't know his name? No. Okay. Do you remember him from that night? Very distinctly. Okay. Can you tell the people on the jury why you remember him? I remembered seeing him with his red shirt, and the thing that caught me was the green earring. And this was when BLM had just come down in front of us. And there was some other gentlemen that were talking with Ryan. They were talking, things were calm. And then I saw him and um, it was kind of a back and forth because I had some of the female protesters that were standing in front of me taunting me. So they wanted, they were doing Black Lives Matter, right? And I just, wasn't taking a side, I was just there to protect a business. So I would look and survey and go to them and I would look and survey and I would see Rosenbaum um, standing there. And I saw the classic bags in his back pocket. I didn't know what it was. Um, and then, can I, can I go on? Well, uh, is there anything that he had said that evening that you took notice of or would remember? Yeah, that's the part I was kind of getting to is, okay. um, I know you guys call him Mr. Yellow Pants, and that's kind of what we called him. He jumped up on the car, and everybody started screaming, get off the car, and Black Lives Matter was screaming, and he was shouting, and Rosenbaum started shouting back at us that he's going to, pardon me, judge, for saying this and everybody else, but he was going to kill us motherfuckers motherfucking niggers and cut our hearts out. That gentleman on the screen there said that? Yes. Okay. Multiple times. And um, what was every, what was your group's response to that, if any, when he said that? None. We just, you kind of are frozen at the verbiage and the threats coming out of him. I mean, the whole night was quite shocking, but we didn't really do anything. We just kind of stood there. You, you have to ignore that. Was there anything um, else that you saw him do uh, 
that you remembered? Yeah, um, Yellow Pants was screaming. I saw that. I was going back to the uh, ladies that were taunting me and going back and, and looking at him. And as I looked at him, I saw his arm go up and like something, like he lobbed something. And then within seconds, my eyes started watering, my nose started watering, I started coughing. Um, I, I didn't know what a chemical bomb was. I didn't know, all of a sudden I just heard guys screaming, chemical bomb, chemical bomb. And I just pulled my mask up. Did you see him specifically throw something? Yes. Do you remember what it, I'll ask it to you this way. Do you remember what he, th I'm not asking that you say he threw a bomb. I'm asking if you know what was in his hand that he threw. Yeah, he went back and threw like that. Do you remember what he threw? Meaning, did he throw a, what was it? I don't recall. Okay. That evening, did you, while he was in your purview, your sight, did you see uh, Mr. Rittenhouse threaten anyone? Oh, no. Did you see him point his gun at anyone? No. Was there anyone there that um, <laughs> had, I guess, strike that. Um, after you see Rosenbaum, and he does what you say he does, uh, do you see Kyle stay there, or does he leave that moment? Uh, it was later in the evening after uh, the police finally moved them down. We were all standing outside because we kind of thought it was over. And then you just heard the ruckus going on down by the gas station. I think it's the ultimate. And then we heard gunshots. And that's when Kyle and uh, Ryan and Dustin and Lurk, I think, I think his nickname was Lurk or Work. Okay. Um, they then they left. So, did you see? Well, I'll ask it to you this way. So you heard? Are you are you telling me that you heard gunshots and then Kyle left? Yes. And if you recall, how close in time was that to about eleven fifty? If you know. Oh, to the, I, I'll ask it to you this way. How close was it in time you know now that Kyle ended up uh, being chased by Mr. Rosenbaum and shooting Oh, him, right? that was way before. Way before. Yes. Okay. So what I'm asking you is later in the night, was there a time that you were aware that Kyle tried to get back to you? Oh, yes. And couldn't? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's been a while. Um, so we did see him because I, I was standing right along the wall. So I was like the first person when you came up to the business. So I was standing up front and I was watching because the Bearcats were all right there by the intersection and the gas station was right on the other corner. So he did come back. He had his hands in the air and he even said, I'm working over at that business over there. I could hear him telling the police that. And they told him, no, turn around. You can't go through. You have to get back. And we were even yelling, let him through, let him through. Did you see him then turn around and go back? Yeah, I thought he was gonna go back to the ultimate gas station. It looked like he was going over there, so. And is that, is that the last time before the shooting that you saw him? Yeah. Now, from your location, you don't see what happened with Mr. Rosenbaum, Mr. Huber, let me finish, with Mr. Rosenbaum, Mr. Huber, and Mr. Grosskreutz, right? Yes, correct. Do you see Kyle after that? Yes, I do. When? Um, I think after everything had happened, um, he had come back up. I heard from the guys on the roof. They're like, open the door, it's Kyle. So I opened up, because we had to keep the front door locked. Um, I opened up the door. He kind of came running in and kind of fell into me. and. There was a chair right there, so he sat down there. I saw him I saw him after everything had happened. How did he look to you? Uh, totally in shock. Can you give me some physical uh, descriptors that would make... Yes, I'm sorry. Kind of um, you... He was pale. 
uh, sh uh, shaking, uh, kind of stuttering, stammering his words. He was sweating. Do you recall him saying anything? Yes. He, he had come in and he did say, he looked at me. He said, he said right out that he had shot someone and he kind of sat down in the chair and he was looking for his brother. He's asking for his brother, Dominic. And he sat down. I remember him pulling his hair back and he's pulling it back really hard. And just as common was, my God, my life might be over. And just, we're just like, okay, calm down. Did it, after he said his life might be over, did anybody ask him anything about the circumstances about what had happened? Yeah, uh, Dustin had come in at that time and Dustin had commented, Dust, Dustin was kind I'm gonna, of- I'm gonna check yeah, don't, Fair enough. Don't, I don't wanna know what Dustin said. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Did, I'll ask it to you this way then. Did Kyle respond to anything that was said? Yes. What was that? That was that he had to. Um, after he said that, do you know, did you stay? Did you leave? What happened? No, um, he wanted his brother, Dominic, and I know Dominic was on the roof. Um, I took his gun. Uh, like I said, he was just shaking. So I took his gun. I ran out back. Uh, I set his gun on one of the trucks out back. And then I went up the ladder and I called the guys and I yelled, Dominic, get down here. So he came down and when I came back in, they were talking and... You had, my last question or two is, you had said that you had used, uh, you had climbed up a ladder to get up on the roof. Yeah. You just said that, okay. Um, where did you, do you know where those ladders came from? Um, no, I know we went in the business when we first got there and they were all in the back. So it's like a building, and then it's like a back parking lot that's fenced in. Okay. And in that back, fen uh, back fenced in area is where they have the sheds and all that. And Nick went in there and pulled everything out, and that's how the guys have got up on the roof in the back. During the evening, um, throughout the evening, uh, was, was there a period of time that other than doing medic work or medical work, uh, that you saw Kyle doing anything else to kind of assist in the community? Um, yeah, actually, me and Kyle ran, excuse me, <coughs> we ran, I think it's north, is it this, this way up Sheridan? I don't, can't see it. So hold on. <laughs> Sorry, my direction is a little off right now. When you point, <laughs> something I would do. So it's, if you can, are you going this way? Oh, there it is, I'm sorry. That's all right. I'm moving that, that would be, the parties will agree, I think yeah. that's Yeah, right. oh yeah, towards St. James Church. All right. So. so we ran up there because there was, um, they were starting a fire on the um, plant, the plywood doors. They had covered up all the doors and they actually started, or whatever they, whatever you call it, fluid, whatever you want to start a fire, they threw it all over that door and we're trying to start the front door of the church on fire. So me and Kyle had actually run up to that area to try to put the fire out, but somebody, people that were running along with the protesters had gone up there and, and put the fire extinguisher out and then we just walked back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Ms. Fiedler was about with the church. Neither you nor the defendant actually put out any fire at the church. No, not at the church, no. Someone that was with the protesters did that. I believe they're with the protesters. You spoke to the FBI on August 31st, 2020. Is that right? I'm not sure about the date, but yes, I spoke with the FBI. About six days after this all happened? Yeah, probably, yes. And you told them that you contacted the defendant's mother the, the morning after all this happened and told her to be strong. Is that right? Probably, yes. You also said that after this incident, <coughs> you had been in contact with the defendant's attorney. Is that right? 
Uh, no, I, don't, I read that, and I don't know what he meant by that, because I wasn't. I've never spoke to him. So you've read your statement to the FBI? Yes. That was a statement uh, that was a summary of what you said to, off, to Special Agent Tim Walther on August 31st, 2020. Is that right? Yes. And in that uh, summary, it says that, in addition, Fiedler has been in contact with Rittenhouse's attorney, John Pierce, regarding the incident and has provided information she deems helpful to Rittenhouse's legal defense. The, uh, actually, the only thing I ever sent was any kind of video that I had. That is it, which I didn't have much. I'm not a video person. So as far as verbal communication, no. Did you provide video to the defendant's attorney? I might have. I don't know if it was mine personally. I really don't remember because I don't even have it anymore. But shortly after this incident, whether it was your video or someone else, you gave something to the defendant's attorney to help him. Fair enough? I don't, would, yes, I guess, yes. And you don't have that video anymore? No. And you didn't provide it to the FBI? Uh, that's not true. I gave them everything I had. You gave them that video? I gave, yes, I gave them everything I had. I showed them my phone, I showed them anything I had. You, you gave them text messages? I gave them everything I had. So when you say that I gave something to the defense attorney, I don't think that that was my video. I think it was probably a video I seen or something I passed along because I didn't take any video. So it's fair to say that whatever you gave to the defense, you were trying to help the defendant, correct? Yes, I was trying to help the case, not just the defense. And you have watched a lot of the videos that have been put out on the internet of this evening, correct? That is not true. Have you watched any of them? Yeah, I've watched some of them, yes. The reason I ask is because you reference this, these words that Joseph Rosenbaum allegedly said to you and the members of your group. That's not on any video anywhere, is it? No. So you are from West Bend, correct? Yes. You don't live here in Kenosha? Nope. You don't work here in Kenosha? Nope. You've never worked at CarSource? Nope. Never bought a car at CarSource? Nope. Probably had never even heard of CarSource before all this. No, I haven't. You came down here that night with no plan of where you were going to be, what businesses you were going to protect, or anything along those lines. Fair? I personally had no plan, correct. You were coming down with a group of other people from the West Bend area, correct? Yes. You knew there was a curfew in place that night? Actually, I didn't. You knew that they were closing off the on-ramps, off the interstate, so yes. people couldn't come in from out of town to our community like you, correct? Yes. In fact, that's why you came down a little earlier, to try and beat that, didn't you? No, that is not true. You brought along a... 380 pistol? Yes. You were going to use that to protect property? And myself, yes. How were you going to use that pistol to protect property? Sometimes a presence speaks louder than a lot of things. The presence of what? The presence of having the gun and being there at the business. Were you openly carrying the gun? Yes, I was. So you didn't have it in a holster or in a waistband? I did have it. Yeah, I'm sorry. It was on my side in a holster. But you figured if people saw that, they'd be scared off? Somewhat. Like I said, it's a presence. It's knowing that somebody's on the, on the, um, in the area, on the ground, standing there. It's kind of a deterrent to keep them away from the business. And you'd agree with me that the AR-15s that the rest of the group had was an even bigger deterrent, correct? A gun is a gun. And, well, a gun's not just a gun. You're, how many guns have you, are you familiar with in your life? Uh, quite a few. We grew up with them. Including rifles? Rifles, shotguns, yes. Everything. AR-15s? Yes. So you understand there's a big difference between an AR-15 and a pistol, correct? Between an AR-15 and a pistol, yes. There's a size difference. One's much bigger, correct? They can all do the same thing. 
one's much bigger, correct? Size doesn't change what can happen or what it does. Ma'am, did you hear my question? Yes, it is much bigger, yes. Can you please answer? I'm sorry, yes. The AR-15 fires a different cal caliber than handguns, correct? Yes. It fires at a, at a higher velocity, correct? Yes. It is capable of doing damage to some a target much farther away than a yes. pistol, correct? Yes. In fact, AR-15 rounds are capable of penetrating body armor, correct? Oh, I did not know that. Okay. So you followed this group of people coming down from the West Bend area to the 63rd Street car source, is that right? Yes. Before you got there, you had no idea where you were going, you didn't know anything about car source, anything like that, fair to say? Correct, yes, correct. You said at that time you met up with someone who identified themselves as the owner of that location? Yes. You personally didn't have any interaction with that owner, did you? Yeah, I had a conversation with him. Do you remember speaking with um, Steve Spingola, a, uh, an investigator with regard to this incident? I couldn't recall names, but... On September 8th, 2020, you had a phone call with him at about 5.30 p.m. Do you remember that? Uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't recall what... You said you've seen your statement to the FBI. Have you seen the statement that you gave to investigator Spingola? Uh, I guess not, no. Let me, uh, may I approach her on? Sure. Well, I think you should first ensure that she acknowledges the conversation, because up to this point, she says she doesn't know if she had such a conversation. And so I'm so trying to help. Go help. ahead. <clears throat> Ms. Fiedler, I'm going to hand you a document here. I'd like you to take a look at it. Take your time. Okay. And uh, please let me know if you've ever seen that before. I'm not asking you if it's accurate, ma'am. I'm just asking if you've seen it before. Well, no, I've never seen this. Okay, fair. That's answered my question. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> you told this individual, Mr. Spingola, <coughs> that you didn't have any interaction with the owner of Car Source that night, didn't you? No, I don't even recall the conversation, and that's not true. decided that night that you were going to protect the location at 59th and Sheridan. Is that correct? Well, that was decided for us, but yes, that was the end plan, yes. Who decided that? Um, I believe that was the owner and Nick Smith. That was the first time that night that you'd ever met Nick Smith? Yes. You didn't know anything about him before? Nothing. And yet, based on his decision and the owner's decision, you agreed voluntarily to go to the 59th Street car source to protect it. Is that fair to say? Yes, that's fair to say. Nobody made you do that? No, correct. You indicated at one point that the defendant asked you to hold on to his gun while he was helping someone. Is that right? Yes. Hey, can we get that? Do we have it with us? The gun? Can you get it out, please? Do you recall how the defendant was wearing that gun that night? Uh, he had the strap around his shoulder and body, and then the gun pointed down. Is it fair to say that the gun was sort of hanging down the front of his body in the middle? I think when he was walking, yeah, but I know when he was standing there, he, he would always have a hand on, across the front of it, okay. so yeah. I'm going to ask Detective Howard to hold on to that gun uh, and show you. Check it, again. Check it again, please.
Have you both confirmed that it is safe? Okay. Could you uh, stand back a little bit, Detective Howard? I want you to be where the jury can all see you. Why don't you step a little bit this way? Uh, Ms. Fiedler, can you uh, tell us in your own words, and I'll try and have Detective Howard sort of demonstrate, how was the defendant holding that AR-15 when he was on the 59th Street property, if, if you know? Well, the strap was over his shoulder. Okay. Yep, on your neck. Would the gun hang loose or would he hold on to it? Just like that. Okay. So holding it with his right hand on the pistol grip? Yes. And sometimes holding it with his left hand or not? Depending? That could be, I don't recall. Okay. I'm pretty sure that's how, how but when it, it when it came time for him to help someone out, he took it off and asked you to hold on to it. Is that yes. right? Okay. Thank you, Detective. You indicated that there was a time in which some females came to the property and were taunting you. Is that yes. right? Yes. And you indicated that they were chanting Black Lives Matter at you? Yes. And you took that to be them taunting you? No, they were saying other things. Okay. You'd agree with me, though, the only thing you've told us so far is the words Black Lives Matter. Uh, yeah, but I could go into the whole story, but we'd be here all for a while. You also said that there was a man wearing yellow pants who jumped up at a, on a car. Is yes. that right? Was that one of the cars that was on the lot? Yes. And the members of your group told him to get off the car, didn't yes. they? Yes. And, in fact, pointed a gun at him while telling him to do that, correct? Yeah, he pointed his gun at us first. Oh, the man in the yellow pants had a gun? Yes, he had a gun. He and had then, a couple guns. And then your group pointed guns back at him? I don't know who pointed a gun at him. I don't know if they did or not. I didn't. I was busy watching my areas. So you indicated earlier that you brought along your pistol to protect yourself and property. Is that right? Yes. How are you going to use it to protect property? It is, it is lawful to be armed while protecting one's property. It is not lawful to use deadly force in the protection of property. And it's important that we not get confused. And I'm not trying to confuse the issue, Your Honor. I'm asking how she was planning on using the pistol to protect the property. I don't believe, I think I'm, I was going to come back to it. How, how are you going to use that pistol to protect property? Like I said, it's a deterrent. You weren't planning on firing it to protect property, were you? No. You weren't planning on aiming at anyone to protect property, were you? No. You indicated that, that Mr. Rosenbaum made some statements, and I'm not going to repeat them all. But uh, you indicated that no one in your group responded to anything he said. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's very fair. You said you pretty much have to ignore that, correct? Yes. It's fair to say you didn't consider him a, an actual threat to your safety at that moment, did you? Not for the distance and for the group that was around, no. Mr. Lakowski characterized him as a babbling idiot. Would you agree with that? I didn't hear him babbling. I just heard him, well, I don't know if babble's a good word, if I may. He was just bitching. He was a little guy, right? I, I, I thought he was like the same height I am, but... How tall are you? I'm well, five, four and a half. You said he, Mr. Rosenbaum's arm went up and he might have thrown something, but you have no idea what it was, correct? Correct. You were then asked about a period of time in which the Kenosha police pushed the crowd past the 59th Street location. Do you remember that part of the evening? Yes. And this is the time period when the defendant has uh, gone south of 60th, and you said he tried to come back at one point, etc. Do you remember that time period in the yes, evening? Yes, yes. There were no protesters around 59th Street after the police pushed them back at that time, correct? That's not totally true. 
there was an empty lot directly across the street from us and there were protesters that were walking on the other side of the Bearcats. The police were screaming at them to get away from there and they just kept walking through. After the police pushed the crowd, did any protesters come and stand in front of the 59th Street car source? After they pushed them past yeah. 60? They didn't push them past 60, excuse me, past the gas station. <laughs> let, me, let me make sure I'm being clear here. Okay. Ms. Fiedler, I'm going to use the pointer here on the map behind okay. you. And just, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this map, so let me, uh, yes, there's, a, there's a location on the map that is marked car source, and that is on the southwest corner of 59th Street and Sheridan Road. You would agree with me that that's the property that you were at the whole evening, correct? That's south, the one you were pointing at? Um, I'm pointing, you can see where I'm pointing. Yes. That is on the southwest corner. Oh, I'm sorry. Of 59th Street and Sheridan Road. Yes. You'd agree with me that's the property you were at all evening, correct? Yes. And there's a time when the police move down Sheridan, past that location south, and establish a line of armored and police vehicles here across the intersection of 60th and Sheridan. Do you remember that? Yes. After that. No protesters come back to 59th Street, correct? No, that's not true. You talked about the time when people were walking through the pile of rubble, is that right? No, I Who, mentioned what, that. What protesters came out and stood in front of 59th Street car stores after the police pushed them past? They didn't, well, the police also turned their bear cats around and backed up and all the protesters then came at us and bricks were flying, bombs were flying everything they came at us with full force that's why i had to go inside okay and i apologize i probably have not explained myself properly let's go to the end of the evening you remember the the defendant coming back the shootings all that leading up into that the, f the few minutes before that that was the second time that the police had pushed everybody down to 60th correct yes correct i'm talking about that period of time at the end after that when the police come by that final time, the protesters have all been cleared south of 60th, correct? No. You remember protesters around 59th Street car stores after we that? We were pelted for almost the whole night from after the Bearcats backed up. They came and they, bombed, they bombarded us. And then they left again because we had come out again and we, they heard sh shootings and some other people had left, but then they came back at us and I was in, inside the building basically probably the rest of the evening. You testified in response to one of the defense attorney's questions that you thought it was over when the police pushed the protesters south. Correct. And they stopped there and that was before they had backed up. We had thought it was over. Okay. So you talked about the defendant returning to the 59th Street car source location, yes. correct? Now let's be clear. You never saw any of the shootings in this case? That's correct. You uh, don't have any personal knowledge about any of that stuff, fair to no. say? No, yep, none. You've been asked about Mr. Rosenbaum. At, the, at that evening, you had no idea what his name was. Correct. You've described what you saw about him that night, correct? Yes. As you sit here today, you know there's a person by the name of Anthony Huber, correct? Yes. That night, you never saw him once, correct? No, I don't. No, I have not. Okay. You'd agree with me it's correct? You've never yes, seen him? Yes, I'm it. sorry. Yes, you're correct. You know now, today, there's a person by the name of Gage Grosskreutz. Is that correct. yes? Correct. That night, never saw him, had no idea who he was. Correct. correct? You indicated that when the defendant returned to your location, he said to you that he had shot someone. Is that right? Correct. Meaning one person. That's what someone is, I guess. He never said to you he shot three people, did he? No. He never told you that any of those people had a gun. Did he? No, he didn't really describe anything about what had happened. He never told you that any of those people threatened him in any way, did he? Nope. He never told you that any of those people had any weapons on them, 
Did he? No. Correct? Correct. I'm sorry, you did answer. There came a time in which Nick Smith came back to that location and said the police were coming, correct? Yes. And after that, all of you got out of there, correct? Not immediately. In your FBI statement, you said soon after Nick came into the location and stated that police were coming to the building. Everyone then left the building, no. correct? No, I had to go get the guys off the roof. But then everybody left, correct? We came down and everybody else that was down there previously was gone, yes. Including the defendant? Yes. After hearing that police were coming, correct? I, I thought they left with Nick. I didn't know. I have nothing further. I just have a couple questions for you, ma'am. Okay. Um, you were asked about Mr. Rosenbaum, and there was questions about uh, how you would describe him and how others had described him. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. Um, did you ever have any direct contact with Mr. Rosenbaum? No, it was just it was just that when we were standing at the 50 or yeah, 59th Street, just seeing him when Yellow Pants was jumping on the car. So Mr. Rosenbaum had never directed, if I'm right, had he ever directed any threat specifically to you? No, not specifically to me. Had he ever physically ran after or chased you? No. When you said that you were being harassed, or I think that's the word you used. Taunted. Taunted, sorry. Um, what were some of the things they were saying to you? Uh, they were calling me out. Uh, come on, Blondie, come on out here. Um, not so tough, put your gun down. Yep. As soon as I didn't give them their power sign, they just got a little bit more aggressive because they were actually kind of friendly at first. Everything was very friendly at first. When you, um, Mr. Binger said you never actually saw Mr. Rosenbaum throw anything. Remember him asking for saying that? Yes, he, I remember. Okay. Is this fair? After you saw his arm move, did you see a gas bomb explode? I believe that it landed on the roof. I don't know because immediately, like, the eye started watering, the nose started running. So I can't say that I saw anything like that. No. And Mr. Binger was asking you questions about you never, uh, what uh, Mr. Rittenhouse didn't see when he got into the building, right? He didn't tell you specifics about what happened. Is that true? Correct. But he did say that he had to do it. Is that right? Yes. I don't have anything else. Any questions? Here we are. Mr. Okay. Let's take a break, folks. Uh, please don't talk about the case during the break. Uh, read, watch, or listen to any account of the trial. Attorneys, uh, here are the uh, six photographs which were uh, graciously sent to us by uh, the photographers. And um, please take a look at them. Uh, unless you have objection, I intend to offer them as the next six sequential exhibits.
Uh, good in the record. Any objection to the receipt of these uh, uh, photographs? I understand. Are we going to be able to use them as a case? Sure. They're exhibits. The reason I had them prepared. I'm trying to make a record. Sorry. I do. Okay, go back to your mics. Go back to your mics. The state doesn't object. All right. I'm going to, I received these. I, this is not an unusual practice that I will have a photograph taken either by one of the litigants or myself uh, so that it's better in the record than just somebody trying to describe what's being portrayed. So I had the photographers who were kind enough to uh, take these pictures, and um, they are now exhibits A through E. Um, in the record, is there any objection? No. And they are exhibits in the case, which you may use if you wish. Okay. What time do you want to start, Judge? Um, I didn't. I didn't say that. But uh, how about uh, Friday? Uh, <laughs> um, how about uh, uh, two forty-five?
check from lunch. What's that? I can hear voices on TV. Really? Yes. Okay. Um, just leave that package there and have Kevin do with it what he wants. How do you know it's there? Because I'm watching uh, from the doorbell. Oh, I already called I Kevin. got an eye on you all the time, lady. Yeah. I already, okay. I moved it so you could get the car in the garage. Okay. Um, Kevin's going to come back later tonight. All right. The whole country is hearing you now while you're talking to me. Oh, that's nice. Okay. And I don't even... <laughs> I don't even whisper sweet nothing. Hello? Would you come down, please? Yes. Thank you.
right, let's proceed. That's what called Nathan DeBroom. Uh, Your Honor, if the record reflects that uh, Mr. Represented by Terry Rose, Rose and Rose attorneys. Thank you. Thank you. Some testimony about to give this matter be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but truth to help you guide. I do. You may be seated. Good afternoon, sir. Could you please state your full name, spelling your last name for the record? Nathan D. Bruin, D E B R U I N. Mr. DeBruin, where do you, not your address, but where do you reside? Kenosha. And are you employed in a local business? Um, in the area. Okay. And do you have any hobbies? Photography and photojournalist. Okay. And are you what would be considered a freelance photojournalist? Yes, sir. And in the course of those duties, um, did you come down to the Kenosha demonstrations and riots? I did. Okay. And could you describe for the jury, please, what was the first night, Sunday night, like? There was a lot of people. Um, I started um, taking or capturing pictures um, over by the Jacob Blake's residence. Um, there was a lot of police presence over there. Um, so I started over there, and it eventually went down to the area of Civic Park. Okay. And now, on that night, was there a lot of property destruction? On Sunday? Yes. Not necessarily property, I would say. Okay. Um, well, I saw a lot of police cars damaged um, and police, like, sheriff vehicles damaged. Okay. And... Where was most of that damage centered, if you know? Um, the, by the, I don't know the avenue, but where the Jacob Blake's, like where the original situation happened. Okay. Did you spend any time in downtown in Civic Park? I did. Anything like that? Did, was there any damage or destruction down there? Not that I recall. Okay. Now, directing your attention to the night, the second night, which would be Monday night, did you... Um, come down and cover the civil unrest? I did. Okay. Was that night different than the first night? Yes. Okay. Could you describe for the jury that difference, please? Uh, the difference was um, there was a lot of vehicles um, that, that the city used as barricades that were um, ended up being torched, lit, lit on fire. Um, there was a heavy police presence. Um, also, when the police were present, there was a lot of rioters, protesters throwing objects at the police. And during the night of the 24th, you took a lot of still photo photographs? Yes, I did. And you also took video photographs, correct? Yes, I did. And a lot of those still photographs and video photographs were of interest from that evening to law enforcement regarding the arson that was occurring in the community, correct? Correct. And you provided all of your information to the ATF, FBI? Yes, I did. You let them download your um, cameras and phones? Yes. And eventually that same information was turned over to the Kenosha Police Department, correct? Correct. And you met with Detective Howard sitting at the table? Yes, I did. Okay. And you told him about your observations of that evening? I did. And. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you were able to tell the story through pointing at pictures that had date stamps, times, and you were able, because you're a resident, able to tell places. Objection leading. Rephrase your question. When you took a photograph, did you know where it was taken? I did. Did you know what time it was? I did. How'd you do that? The time stamp on the camera. Okay. And then my knowledge of being a resident in the city most of my life. Okay. And you're the first witness that has ever done this, but you brought your own exhibits, correct? I did. Okay. And I didn't ask you to do that? You did not. Okay. And there's a series of like 24 big photographs that I'm going to go through with you. Do you know who took these? I did. Okay. Showing you what's been marked as Defense Exhibit 111. Could you tell me what that is? 
I am standing on the corner of Ruther's Central High School parking lot, um, just about to walk towards Sheridan Road. And what does that picture depict? Uh, the police lining up as uh, they started to clear out Civic uh, Park. Do you know what time that is about? Uh, 9.03. So I do believe 10.03 because my camera was off one hour. And you and How Detective Howard worked out that problem, correct? Yes, we did, but it's not going to reflect on this. Okay, because your times were off by one hour, correct? Correct. Compared to all the other evidence? Yes. And you know how that happened? Yes, because uh, just prior to that, I was on vacation in South Dakota. Okay, and that's in a different time zone? Yes, sir. Showing you what's been marked is... Defendants Exhibit 112, could you tell me what that is? Um, I'm, move, I'm moving closer towards Sheridan Road. Um, I'm out now on the corner of Ruther Central High School on the grass just before going onto the sidewalk and the police are closing the gap on Sheridan Road. What night are all these exhibits taken? August 25th showing you what's been marked on the front as Defense Exhibit 113. Could you tell me what that is? I am now on Sheridan Road and hugged up against Ruther Central High School. Hey, does Ruther Central High School have any significance to you? I did. Um, that was my high school. Okay. And this photograph would be looking down Sheridan Road in a northerly direction from your point of view? Yes, it is. And what does it depict in the back part of the photograph. Like you saw in the two photographs earlier, the police were still in Civic Park. Now the police lined up actually on Sheridan Road. Okay. And there are other individuals, um, demonstrators or rioters or whatever you want to call them, and they're more to the right. Correct. Okay. Correct. Could you hand that to the judge? Showing you what's been marked as exhibit Defendants 114. I am still advancing southbound on Sheridan Road, and I captured a photo when the police started using the tear gas, gas bombs. I don't know the technical term. Can you tell me what time that is? That is at 9.43. And that's 9.43 real time? Yes, I do believe. Okay. Showing you what has been marked, well, let me back up a second. Through your involvement in this case, reading things, you became aware of who Joseph Rosenbaum is? Yes. You became aware of the significance of him? Yes, I did. And you went over that with Detective Howard from the Kenosha Police Department? Yes, I did. Showing you what's been marked as on the front, Defendant's Exhibit 115. Could you tell me what that is? That is a picture of a cone that is on fire with Rosenbaum with his hands up with his what I assume to be a bake that you just got out of jail with at the time um, in an angry stance. Okay. And where is Mr. Rosenbaum standing? The ultimate gas station. Okay. In the street? Um, yes, just off, off of the driveway to go into ultimate gas. Okay. And in the four of the picture, there's some people trying to get some cones burning? Correct. And there's, everybody's attention seems directed at somebody or something. Do you know who that is or what it was? It, it, Your Honor, I wasn't quite done. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Every, everybody seems to be looking in a general northerly direction, correct? Correct. Do you know who or what they're looking at? Um, there was recently a dumpster fire that was on fire. I do believe that was before this. Okay. 116, once again. Uh, once again, um, there is some protesters, riot rioters, um, adding to the fire, um, adding more cones to make the fire bigger, with Rosenbaum in the back still screaming. Um, and almost in the exact same location. What time is that? That is at 10.08. Defense Exhibit 117, what does this depict? 
This is a garbage can that was just recently on fire, and a gentleman, I do not know who it is, um, holding a loaded pistol. And um, he's, did you see him, what was he doing with the pistol? He's just walking around with a pistol out? When people in the ultimate gas station started arguing and things started heating up, um, he pulled out his uh, pistol from his waistband, cocked it, and held it at his side. When you say cocked it, describe that for the jury. Um, he, took it from, he took it from his waistband and loaded it, pulled the uh, rack back, and it was armed then, ready to shoot. Directing your attention to Defendant's Exhibit 118, what does that show? So there was a time where the police pushed us towards the ultimate gas station, but then they retreated. And that's when the rioters and protesters advanced again back northbound um, on Sheridan Road, so closer back to um, Ruther Central High School. But in this photo, this is a photo of Rosenbaum walking to the St. James lot that was under construction at the time. And this is where, just before he tips over a porta potty. Okay, and just so this record is, you're not just taking pictures of Mr. Rosenbaum, correct? I am not. Right. I did not know who he was. Okay, you're just taking pictures of everything you see that interests you? Correct. And then later on, you turn those over to the state, the ATF, and you go through them and you start seeing what you think might be important. Is that a fair statement? It is. And could I have a time on Defendants 118? 10, 15 p.m., August 25th. Okay. Showing you what's been marked as Defense Exhibit 119. Could you tell me what that is? This is Mr. Rosenbaum um, with another gentleman who I do not know, um, tipping over a porta potty that was in the St. James lot that was under construction at the time. And so where is the St. James lot as you refer to it in relationship to car source at 59th? It is directly next to it. Okay, so right, right across the street? There is a, yeah, there is a road, and then the uh, car source. And that porta potty had been in an upward position? Yes, it was. And Mr. Rosenbaum and this masked individual um, tipped it over and threw it over the fence? They did. And what were they trying to do to it once they got it out in the road? It looked like they were going to use it as a barrier. Okay, and in that picture, Describe Mr. Rosenbaum's clothing. He has, it looks like black shorts on, a reddish, a reddish t-shirt, a blue bandana wrapped around his entire face. And a, he's holding a plastic bag in his right hand. Showing you what's been marked as Exhibit 120. Tell me what that depicts. This is a, a trailer that was also in the St. James parking lot at the time. After they flipped over the porta potty, they went back for a trailer, and Mr. Rosenbaum helped pull and push this trailer out to the road that was eventually tipped on its side and lit on fire. And when you took the picture, did you know what they were going to do with the trailer? I did not. Did you see any chains or anything like that on that trailer? Especially leading. Did you notice anything on that trailer that might later be used as a weapon? Uh, you rephrase your question. Yeah, it is leading. A leading question is one that we talked about that already. Um, it's, it's leading. Did you notice anything on that trailer? Let me, I'll ask it this way. Did Mr. Rosenbaum get anything from that trailer? Yes, he did. He once it was out um, in the middle of the road and set on its side, there was chains dangling from the what I perceived the front end of the trailer that you would connect to a vehicle. There was multiple chains hanging from there, and he armed himself with a chain. Okay, those are what would commonly be used to take the trailer and you hook it from the trailer 
to a vehicle that's going to tow it. So if it were to separate, yes, sir. it's a protective chain, correct? Yes, sir. These aren't little, thin little chains? No. And you personally saw him take those? Yes. Could I have a time on that, please? August 25th, 10, 16 p.m. Is that time the South Dakota time or our time? I, I can look at the report when I'm done and clear that up. Well, why don't you clear it up now? So we are clear on that. markings on the back, the times, are off by one hour, correct? Correct. Okay, and they're on South Dakota time? Correct. And that's because you come back from a vacation? Yes, sir. So if it were to say on the back of these, because they were printed off from a computer? Yes. And the number up here in the back of the has a JPEG number? Yes. So the computer just printed out this label, correct? No, I made that label. Okay, but you printed it out to match the time? Yes. Okay, so if a time is 8.11 p.m., that's really 9.11 p.m. Correct. And that's for all of the photographs and all of the labels. Yes, sir. Showing you what's been marked, Defense Exhibit 121, could you tell me what that is? This is how, like I said earlier, a uh, trailer was pulled out of the St. James parking lot. Um, th this is the trailer itself tipped over on its side um, and being lit on fire next to a garbage can. And you can also see Mr. Rosenbaum armed himself with a chain, and there's still also chains hanging from the trailer. Okay, and that's would be in Mr. Rosenbaum's left hand, correct? Yes, correct. And there's a, a length of chain on each side of his left hand hanging down to the ground. Correct. It, it goes through the hand, there's a chain here oh. and chain here. Two separate chains or one chain? I don't think the picture can tell. Okay, gotcha. You, do you know whether it's one chain or two? I do believe it was just one chain. And, go ahead. Defense Exhibit 122, once again. This is also uh, another picture of Mr. Rosenbaum with his what I assume to be a bag you got out of jail in his right hand and the chain in his left hand. Okay. And now the chain is up so you see the full length of it. Correct. It's not hit, not, it's obscured by the bag. Correct. Defendant's Exhibit 123, do you recognize that? I do. This is Mr. Rosenbaum now fully in the upright position, um, holding his chain in the bake that I described, and he has a blue bandana wrapped around his face. And that's a continuation of this series? Yes, it's okay. still the trailer that is and lit on fire. Are you that close, or are you using a lens? Do you know? I am pretty close. Okay. 121. This is a uh, Farther away picture of the trailer that was tipped on its side. Um, Mr. Rosenbaum is in, away from the fire, um, now at this time, still holding his um, bag, and I cannot tell what is in his other hand. And it was brought to my knowledge that another person in here is named Joshua Zeminski. Okay, and Mr. Zeminski is the individual in the khaki pants with the black hoodie? Yes. And he's, for, what's he doing to the fire? It looks like he is kicking more debris into the fire to accelerate it. Okay. Would it be fair to say that that photograph 124, you're further away when the picture is taken? Correct. Defendants 125. I was advancing um, again south on Sheridan Road. I am now at the, almost the corner where the gas station next to car source is, um, and the police just released more gas or tear, tear bombs, I don't know okay. the technical term. Now, I'm gonna show you some video later on, but 
Were you anywhere near um, the gunshots that eventually broke out about 10 to midnight? Yes, I was. Okay. Could you hand that to the judge, please? Showing you what's been marked as Defense Exhibit 126. Do you know what that is? Yes, this is one of the very last photos I took from Sheridan Road in 61st, I want to say. This photo is of the armored sheriff vehicles um, showing up to a 10-2 gauge that was just shot in his bicep. And you can even, I mean, your picture is so good, you can read where that is from? or. Yes, uh, it says uh, Sheriff's Rescue Vehicle. It doesn't, I don't see a name okay. or a city. But that's, I mean, this is before the area's even been cordoned off, correct? Correct. Okay, go ahead. If you, okay, why don't you give me a time on that one? August 25th, 10.51 p.m. Showing you a picture of Defense Exhibit 127. After the shots were fired um, and it started getting really intense, um, I decided to retreat and go back home for the night. I did not have a vehicle down there. Um, I was walking back towards 22nd Avenue and there was gunshots going on all around me and there was a group of police outside, I don't know the technical term, I think it's like a correctional use facility here in Kenosha. Um, they were out there with their rifles out and pistols drawn and I had a black camera around my neck and they pointed their lights at me and I raised my hands um, and they just told me to keep going and I asked what's going on and they just confirmed that there was multiple gunshots. And that was at August 25th, um, 11.04 p.m. Defense 128. This is a little further up 63rd Street, just past the last officers that I talked to. Okay. And this one somehow got a little bit out of order. I'm going to show you a Defense Exhibit 130. Can you tell me what that is? This is a photo of a gentleman walking through some sm tear gas outside of our courthouse in Kenosha. Okay, and what time was that taken? 8.11 p.m. August 25th. Okay, so that would be for real time nine. Yes. And lastly, showing you defense exhibit 129. Could you tell me when that photograph was taken? This is the very last photo I took of that night. Um, and this is of where Rody's camera shop used to be. Okay, and where is Rody's camera shop in Kenosha? I'm gonna drift the relevance of this line of questioning. This is not happening. <coughs> This evening, it's his opinion as to what was going on and why he covered the story. Uh, the objection is sustained. Does Rody's camera have a special significance to you? Objection relevance. Uh, I don't want to get sidetracked. Yeah, okay. The objection is sustained. Showing you a very large photograph on the back marked Defense Exhibit 131. Do you recognize that? I do. Can you tell me what that is? This is of Ruther Central High School of a bunch of people cleaning graffiti off from the night before. Okay. Is there, when you took that picture, did you know anybody in it? I did not. After knowing about this case, and meeting with Detective Howard, did you know the significance of this picture? I do. And what is it? 
Uh, Mr. Rittenhouse is in here cleaning graffiti off of Ruther Central High School. And there's how many people in this photograph? Nine, including Mr. Rittenhouse. Okay. And could you tell me what time that photograph was taken? August 25th, 11.43 a.m. Okay. So that would be right after, right before 1 o'clock? Correct. Real time. And this photograph? This is of a group of protesters. I do believe the night before, August 24th. I don't know what, uh, what, why don't you put in a question? You were covering all three nights of the demonstrations and riots, correct? Yes. During the photograph, the large photograph, and I can't see on the back, I think it's 134, 133. Is this before or after things turned ugly? Objection. It's a, what happened that I, I have August 24th is irrelevant to this. I'd ask if it is, if it is not admitted that they not be shown to the jury while it's a process of figuring out the correct time. I don't see the relevance. Now, during the evening, going over those pictures, you were asked whether or not you heard any statements from Mr. Rosenbaum. Is that a fair statement? Yes, it is. And do you remember what Mr. Rosenbaum said or did during that night? Yes, I remember a few phrases. Okay. You talk about the bag. Do you remember that? Yes. And you made a statement about the source of the bag? I did. What was the belief? Strike that. Why did you believe that? That he just got out of jail? Connection calls for hearsay and speculation. I don't know. There was earlier... Um, I read something some time ago which gave an, well, um, maybe two months ago, there was paperwork came in here that made somewhat different from what has been stated here in testimony as far as the origin. It was that, is that somewhere in the evidence? Yes. I mean, in the available evidence, not in the evidence that's been presented. No. Yes. This is this goes to what the court said could be gone into about Mr. Rosenbaum's behavior. Those statements. Well, there, there, there's an, a specific statement. Is there? That will come in. There, is there an available witness that's going to testify? To this? Yes. All right. Oh, go ahead. I, 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 I wait, wait a second. I think there's some misunderstanding. I'm sorry. Can you start over? I, I think I know where the court's going. I think there's a misunderstanding we should discuss. You know what? Let's. Um, you don't have to go upstairs. You're welcome to do so. But in the meantime, we'll go into the, uh, the Brewer's uh, Library. And uh, please don't talk about the case. We, uh, this won't be long. I'm quite certain that at one point I read uh, that uh, uh, remark was attributed to Mr. Rosenbaum. I just got out of jail, and I'm not afraid to go back, or words to that effect. 
Did I, did I, you say you have a witness who can testify to that? Yes. Oh, he heard it? Yes. What's your objection? My objection is discussing this belief of uh, where this bag came from. He doesn't know. If he wants to, I mean, I would object to hearsay to the, the Rosenbaum statements because obviously there's enough context, and Mr. Rosenbaum clearly isn't here to testify. So I do believe they are hearsay, although I understand the court's pretrial ruling. Uh, but uh, my, I thought we were getting a little mixed up here, which is why, which I wanted to clarify. I thought that when Your Honor was talking about things coming in that indicated something else, I thought we were going to go into this line of questioning that Mr. Rosenbaum was getting out of jail, which I believe is not in dispute that he's getting out of the hospital. So I just wanted to clarify that. I do believe, if they want to ask him what he heard, fine, but I don't believe the, the proper form of the question is, where, how did you get your belief that this bag was from jail? There's no dispute that this bag was from jail, that this bag was not from jail. Uh, and I think to repeatedly mention jail when it wasn't an issue in this case is- but, You know, I, I, I'm not in a position to know, you say it's not in dispute, and that may not, that may be that it hasn't been in dispute up to this point. If the witness is, that is his recollection, it's not for me to slam the door. Uh, I understand what you're saying, but if the witness recalls that, you're certainly welcome to cross-examine him on that, and you're welcome to present contrary evidence, but I don't think it's for me to censor the evidence. I, I, I just believe the form of the question is appropriate, which is how did you form your belief that the bag was from jail? But did not the witness already say that? No. But he just said it, so now he's asking him, why do you say that? Am I, am, am my memory just... And I'm trying not to lead him, so I was setting the stage for the statement. I mean, you want me to... What did, <laughs> what did you hear him say? There's three different well, statements. I, well, I, you I, asked him three times. Okay, uh, uh, the objection's overruled. Uh, ask the jurors to come back in, please. Objection has been overruled. Go ahead. Sir, did you hear Mr. Rosenbaum say anything about the bag? I did. What was that? That he's not afraid to go back to jail. <clears throat> and you told the detective that when you were interviewed back on September 11th of 2020, correct? Correct. Now, directing your attention to the ultimate gas station approximately 5900 Sheridan Road. Did you see um, an incident regarding a dumpster? I did. Did you see who was lighting and pushing that dumpster? I did not. Did you see what happened to that dumpster? I did. What? It was, the fire was put out okay. by a fire extinguisher. And when the fire in the dumpster was put out by the fire extinguisher, was there any reaction from the people who were starting the fire? Yes, a very angry reaction. Okay, did you recognize or notice anybody's specific reaction at that time? I did, Mr. Rosenbaum. Okay, describe that please. He was very agitated. Um, he was yelling, fuck the police, over and over and over. I'm not afraid to go back to jail and shoot me N-word shoot me n-word but he was using the whole word correct at a black lives 
Lives Matter rally? Correct. And he had to be held back from attacking people. Is that a fair statement? That is a fair statement. Not at the time. Okay. Did you know the significance of him running at the time? I did not. Had you heard anything before you saw this individual running at you? Not running at you, but running? No. Okay. And do you know who that individual is now? I do. And how do you know that? Through identification, through ph photographs in the media, I okay. guess I could say. Okay. And who is that person? Uh, Kyle Rittenhouse. Okay. Describe what you observed. What direction was Kyle running? He was running southbound towards 63rd Street. Okay. So he's running away from the 60th Street? No, hang on. Running south, if that's easier. Okay. And how, how far did you see him get? I saw him enter, I don't know what car source it is, but the car source that's on the corner across from the hospital, I saw him up, go up in that driveway, and that was the last. Is the pointer? Uh, pointer? Yes. Oh, oh. Uh, this pointer? You know, the laser one? Yeah. Did you see the map behind you? Just orient you. This is north. Yes. This is south. So this would be east, west. Here's a car source. Gas station, ultimate, car source, car source. Where did you first see Kyle Rittenhouse on this map, if you could point with the laser pointer? Is that the hospital down here? Yeah, this is the hospital parking lot. Um, is this Sheridan Road? Yes, it is. Um, I would probably say I saw Kyle right around here. Okay, and he was heading in a southerly direction? Yes. And he goes where? to car source. Okay, and when he goes into the car source parking lot, could you see him anymore? I could not, know. Did you follow him? I was making my way up there, but not in an urgent manner. Okay, and describe what happened next. I heard what seemed to be like a firework, and then I heard, I could tell between them, uh, there was multiple gunshots. And then what did you observe? I observed Kyle walking down the same driveway that I witnessed him going up and then pick up his pace as he continued northbound on Sheridan Road. Okay. Was anybody taking note of Kyle as he headed in a northward direction on Sheridan? There was people screaming at him um, and also following him. Okay. Did you see anybody run up to him? I did. Okay. And how close were you to Kyle when this individual ran up to him? 15 feet, maybe. Okay. And that individual who ran up to him, what happened? Um, what I seen was an individual run up to him with a skateboard and swing it at him, letting go of the skateboard, and it hit Kyle between the neck and, I would say, the mid-back. And the skateboard, I don't know if he, Kyle kicked it because he was running when the skateboard fell, but the skateboard flew off to the side. Okay. And did that knock Kyle to the ground? Just, leading. Just, just tell us what you saw, sir. He's, he stumbled. He wasn't necessarily on the ground at that point. Okay. And then what did you observe? The next thing I observed was, at the time I did not know who it was, um, now I can say Anthony Huber, it looked like he was trying to subdue Kyle, and that's when everything happened in a matter of a second. Um, that's when Kyle turned, it looked like he turned, because Kyle was on the ground at this time, and that's when he kind of turned and he released one shot and it hit Anthony Huber in the chest. Okay. Did you see Anthony Huber do anything with his skateboard as he's trying to, as you said, subdue Kyle? Yes, um, he also whacked him. I don't know if it was on his head or like his neck area again. Okay, this is all happening very fast? <laughs> yes, it did. Okay. And there was also a lot of people on my side of... Can you bring up the exhibit, please?
Did, were you able to see that video? If you could play it one more time. Yeah, can you go back even 10 seconds earlier? yourself in that video? I do not. Okay. Were you there? I was. Okay. And what did, what did you observe when Kyle went to the ground? I observed two gentlemen run up to Kyle. One, it looked like, was trying to hop on top of him and take his gun. And the other was hesitant um, of approaching him. Um, but then Anth he, Kyle Rittenhouse fired their shot, and it hit Anthony Huber. Okay. Did you see anything after that? Um, uh, he, who I now know as Gage, um, took a couple steps forward towards Kyle and, um, with a gun, and Kyle shot him in the bicep. Did you see what Gage Grossquitz was doing with his hands? Yes, he had a firearm in his hand. You could see that? Yes, I could see that. And he was approaching Kyle with a firearm in his hand? I don't know if he was running with it, but once he got up to Kyle, I did see the firearm. Okay, and what did he do as he approached Kyle? So I would have been on the back side of Gage, so I don't know. Did the witness use the formal mode of address as we've been ordered to do so? Go ahead. Mr. Uh, Groskoitz, as opposed to using his first name. Oh, okay. Uh, Mr. How do you say his last name? Groskoitz. Groskoitz. Good enough for okay. you. Um, Mr. Groskoitz's back was towards me. Um, well, it was at an angle. I wasn't directly behind him. So I only could see one of his hands. Okay. And describe what you saw happen. He had his firearm out um, pointing at Kyle. Okay. And as the gun's pointing at Kyle, what happened? Kyle shot Mr. Grosskreutz. How close was Kyle Rittenhouse and Mr. Grosskreutz from your vantage point? If I would have had to have guessed under three feet. Now, you were originally subpoenaed by the state, correct? Correct. You met with the state representatives, Mr. Binger and Mr. Krauss, correct? Correct. And there was some tension in that room, correct? There was. And they weren't happy with what you were telling them. Is that a fair statement? That's a fair statement. Yeah, I'm going to ask, uh, uh, A, it is leading, and B, I want no reaction. Facial reaction, please. Describe your meeting with Mr. Binger and Mr. Krauss in their office. Project relevance. Answer it? Please. Um, I don't know the date off the top of my head, um, but I was called down to the district attorney's office. Um, I met with Mr. Binger and I don't remember his name. The individual who's in the blue. Um, and we were, I was called into a, a room, sat at a table, um, handed my police statement, um, got to read over my police statement. And then I was asked if I would like to add anything um, to the police statement, and I said I would not. Um, Mr. Binger pulled out a cell phone and showed me a video and also a photo, which was actually one photo that I brought today, and asked me to if I knew who a gentleman was in that photo, and I said I did not. And he asked me to, or he, um, he said this is uh, Joshua Zeminski. Um, I, he, Mr. Binger also has a case with him, and I am subpoenaed for that case also. And he says, well, that's who that is. He put the phone down, he picked the phone back up and says, who is this? And I confusingly said, like, Joshua Zeminski, and he's like, would you like to add that to your statement? And I just felt I didn't want to change my statement. Okay. And as a result, what did you do? Um, I hired an attorney. And that's Mr. Rose? Yes. I have nothing further. Um, 
Your Honor, I'd like to move the pictures into evidence. Is there objection? Except for the ones that are objected to relevance yet. No. Uh, well, the one I, there was one that I, uh, I guess there were two that I sustained objection. The remainder will be received. Two of the bigger, the two big ones. The two big ones, and then the third big one wasn't uh, even presented. So all the big ones are rejected. The, uh, well, two of the big ones are rejected. One of the big ones was not offered. I'm sure they'll be very happy uh, wherever it goes when they're defined as the big ones. But, uh, but uh, uh, all of the smaller numbered uh, photographs are received. And I would ask that they be published to the jury, but Mr. Cross can cross-examine first. His preference? That's fine. Okay. Mr. De Bruin. You said there was a lot of tension in the room when you met with me and Mr. Binger and Ms. Beasy? Yes. Is it fair to say that you were very nervous? Yeah, absolutely. And we did have you read over your statement, right? Correct. And we asked if you knew anything beyond that statement? Correct. We didn't ask you to change it? You, yes, you did. Okay. So you said we asked to change it to identify Mr. Zeminski? Yes. Or if I wanted to change any details to, um, how, to how I, if I remember anything else throughout that night, and to add Joshua Zeminski. Now, we met for the case against Kyle Rittenhouse, correct? Correct. Is it fair to say that most of the discussion involved Mr. Zeminski? I would say probably half of it. Because Attorney Binger is prosecuting Mr. Zeminski for arson. Apparently. And you took a number of pictures of that perhaps include Mr. Zeminski, correct? Correct. So Mr. Binger was verifying if you knew that was Mr. Zeminski and asked you if you saw him in some pictures. Uh, apparently. And I, at the time, again, I did not know who Joshua Zeminski was. Now. Just that I w was subpoenaed to be a witness in his trial. So. Why would, so your, your testimony is that the state, in the case against Kyle Rittenhouse, wanted you to present incriminating evidence against Mr. Zeminski? I don't know why he asked me that question. It, I it, found it odd too. Is it possible you didn't understand the question? No, he was pretty clear. And then you said you went and you hired an attorney? I did. How did the meeting end? What do you mean, how did the meeting end? I mean, how did our meeting end? Our meeting or with my attorney? No, I can't ask about your attorney. I mean our meeting in my, in my office with Mr. Binger and Ms. Beasy. Um, it ended with Mr. Binger saying that he would be in touch with me in regards to the Zeminski case. Because we indicated that we would subpoena you for that case. You did subpoena me for that case. And that was the absolute end of the meeting? That I recall. Do you remember that afterwards you and I spoke about your photography and I complimented your photography? We talked about your photography? That was in the beginning. And at the end? Mostly in the beginning because we were waiting for Mr. Binger to get in the room because I don't know, Heather maybe her name was, uh, was in the room and we were just waiting for Mr. Binger to get in the room. It's when you asked me that to be correct. So we never asked you to put anything in about or change anything about Kyle Rittenhouse? Not specifically, no. Because Cal Rittenhouse, that name doesn't even appear in your statement, does it? Mm, I don't think so. Not to my knowledge. And so the discussion about changing statements, did, did we actually ask you to retype your statement out? No. So what do you mean we asked you to change it? I'm assuming he, there wasn't details, but I'm assuming either add Kyle's name or because I was also shown a video off of a cell phone by Mr. Binger. I don't know what that video or whose video that was, but it was of the shooting. And that's when I was asked if I wanted to add anything else to that statement, and I said no. And you took that literally, like actually writing out your statement? Yeah. Okay. You did not take that to mean, is there anything your statement doesn't cover or that we should know? No. You said literally we would retype the statement that you took November 11th. Well, you, he didn't say retype it, but he said, do I want to add anything to that? And to how I interpret that, that's pretty much altering my statement and 
I felt uneasy about that. But you added things to your statement on the stand today. Um, that was because I recall s in videos of certain things happening that so when I, the day I gave my statement, when I walked to the police station, when I walked into that police station, there wasn't even a, a glass door so on that. So how building. is, I'm sorry, how is that different than what attorney Binger asked? Did you want to add anything? How is that any different uh, besides the, than asking if you remember other things? I, when I had a meeting with Mr. Richards, the following night, I want to say, or the following day, around like maybe 3, 3.30, at his office. Mm -hmm. And I was also showing videos there. And prior to things happening in those videos, I was saying things that actually were just about to happen. And he asked me, oh, uh, do you mind if I bring this up? And I said, absolutely. But I did not change. I did not alter that statement. I did not write a new statement out. So no one asked you to write a new statement? No, not to write a new statement, just add so or we both, alter. We both asked the same thing, if you knew more beyond what your statement said. But the way Mr. Binger wanted it, uh, how he portrayed it to me was to add on to my statement physically. Mr. Richards just took notes. Did, did someone ask you to type out a new statement? I'm telling you how I, t I perceived it. You have a bias in this case, don't you? You don't want Mr. Rittenhouse to be found guilty or not guilty? Well, wait a minute. You don't want him to be found guilty or not guilty? You don't, you, you don't have an interest or a bias in which way this trial comes out? I don't, know. I'm did a you, photographer, photojournalist, that's what I do. I take photos. Did you go and give an interview to a, uh, a gossip site that is a bias against the district attorney? I don't know uh, what his site represents. So you actually went to the media, or someone who claims to be media, to talk about this meeting with the prosecutors? First of all, he came to me. I didn't go to him. Let's make that clear. And you understand that he has a bias in this case? I. I don't know. I, I don't know him personally. Stop, 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 stop. I'm sorry. Um, was the objection? Well, let's do this. Uh, let's do this. Um, we need to take one more break before the day's done. Is anyway. Anyway, so why don't we take uh, just a ten-minute break? And please don't talk about the case during the break. Get your objection. Speculation. He's asking. Stop. Oh. Stop. Okay. Speculation, Your Honor. He's asking what he knows about an unnamed reporter's bias. Yeah, that's. I've never heard that before. That he could testify about somebody else's bias. Uh, I asked if he knew about his bias. Well, you know what is it? What does that mean? Do you know about the bias? Um, I can break it. I can ask it a different way. That would be good. And who is that he? would make my day. Uh, all right. Um, so let's uh, take a break. Uh, about, uh, I, I don't. About 10 minutes. You, don't? you ever read this? Go ahead. Sit right here. Uh, you, no, you can walk around if you like, but we need you back in about 10 minutes.
All right. Um, let's proceed. Thank you. Um, you indicated that this uh, blogger approached you. Yes. And do you know how he found out about uh, your feelings? He, yeah, he. I don't think it I'm sorry. Uh, can you repeat the question? Do you know how he found out that you had something to say? What do you mean something to say? Well, you said he approached you. Do you know? Do you know how he knew to approach you? He was at my attorney's office. Um, did you waive attorney-client privilege so that uh, your attorney could talk to him about it? He wasn't in the meetings with my attorney, with me present or anything. So you walked out of your attorney's office and he was there? He was at my attorney's office, just not in conversations in regards to like why I was there. And you know this blogger and your uh, attorney have a very close business relationship? I do not. Do you know anything about this blogger? I do not. So why did you talk to him? He was with the media. Have you talked to all media that ever contacted you? No. And blogger? I, Let me finish the question. Sorry. Did you know that this blogger has posted many articles indicating that he wants Kyle Rittenhouse to be found not guilty? I do not. Did you know this blogger has posted many articles attacking, uh, mostly falsely, my office, the district attorney's office? I do not know this. Did you do guy. any research about who this person was before you spoke to him? No. Uh, I, I don't think the, um, it's relevant. Uh, uh, that was my last question on that, on that topic. Perfect. So, no, on that topic, I, no, I, I know it's on that topic. Thank you. So, would you describe our, our meeting in the DA's office as cordial and uneventful? It was, besides the uneasy feeling I had, it was pretty, pretty much like a normal meeting. So, when we ask you if there's anything to add or beyond your statement, that made you feel uneasy? Yes. But when Attorney Richards asked you the next day, uh, and let, me, let me back it up. So we asked you, you felt uneasy, and you didn't say really anything in addition to your statement. Fair to say? Correct, because I didn't want to change it. So then when Attorney Richards asked you the next day if you have anything to add to your statement, you tell him all sorts of things. He didn't present it to adding my statement. He, he said, can I take notes? He didn't use the word statement like I'm changing my statement. So that, so that the verbiage is what made you uncomfortable? Correct. Did he have you read your statement before you talked to him? I just read it the night before. Okay, so, so the fact that you physically had your statement with us is what made you uneasy? Correct. Okay. Um, so while we're talking about your statement, let's show you what is it marked as. Uh, exhibit 134. Do you recognize this? Yes. That is the police statement I gave on 9-11-2020. And this is the one that we asked you to read in my office? Correct. And you make no mention at all of Mr. Rosenbaum having to be held back? Because this was taken on 9-11. I was a year prior to this when I walked into a building that I really didn't even want to be in. Um, but the ATF, however you guys work on your cases, it was brought to you guys, not me voluntarily. The ATF brought it to you and got you guys involved. By you guys, you mean the detective that's the, investigating this case? Yes. I had a homicide detective over at my house. So you gave the statement on September 11th, 2020? Correct. Is it fair to say that your memory of the events was better on September 11, 2020? Pretty much the same. You're not going to forget this situation ever. Well, then why did you forget to put things in your report? I, first of all, it was, like I said, when I first walked into the police station, I walked through a police station that didn't even have a door, didn't have no glass attached. There was glass on the ground, completely all shattered on the ground. I have photos, don't worry. Um, shattered all over the ground. It was a very, you guys had me waiting constantly. Um, I had to wait to give my statement because they couldn't get a hold of D Detective Howard. So when he came in, it was a really, I, I don't want to say rushed, but it wasn't uh, 
take your time type of deal. You were there for, you gave, you're saying it was an hour and a half long. Be, don't know it, what. Right? I don't know how long it was. And they were in the room within five minutes of you walking in the, I in, don't in the interrogation believe that. room? So your explanation for why your statement leaves things out is because you walked through a door without a window? No. I was, very, I was trying to explain how nervous and anxious I was because, I mean, all around that area, just business, local businesses are being destroyed, everything. And to be walking into a police department in the middle of this time isn't good. I was threatened numerous times throughout the week of me photographing and capturing all, the, all these photos, I was threatened numerous times. So I was uneasy with people still standing outside the police department, walking in, knowing I have to walk out with these people out here. So you gave the statement 17 days after the shooting. Is that accurate? If, yeah. And you're still saying that property was being destroyed and there were protests there was seven no days later? Let me finish my question, please. 17 days later? There, not nothing to the extent of this, the week of the shooting, nothing to that extent, but there was no window in the police station. So, so the fact there was no window made it so you could not give an accurate statement? I'm not saying that. You I just said did. I, it, it's give, it gave me anxiety. Yeah, so make sure you say, say what I'm did. saying. Oh, okay. He he so, did not say he didn't make an accurate statement. That was your words. Not you said, mine. You, your said, words. you said things were left out of your statement. Not on, intentionally. I mean, those are little details. That's a traumatic situation that someone has to go through. I, I just witnessed someone dying. And another person getting their arm almost blown off. 17 days prior. Doesn't matter how long it is. I still suffer to that, from that traumatic still to this day. Do you have, uh, you said you've been nervous, you said you were anxious. Does that really affect your perception of events? It might, no. It's not gonna change, but I, like right now I'm anxious. Like I have anxiety right now. Did you have anxiety when you spoke to us in our office? Absolutely. Now, you and your statement there's no mention of Mr. Rosenbaum having to be held back. Correct. There's no mention of him saying anything about shoot me and words. Sorry, can you repeat that? Sure, sorry. There's nothing in there about saying shoot me and words. Correct. And is that because you saw it on a video later? When I was showing a video at Mr. R Richard's office, as the video was playing, I was telling things that was happening before the video was actually playing. Like, I don't know, before the, the details that I said coming out my mouth happened on the video. So did you observe him say that or did you see it on a video? I saw, I heard him say it and like, like what are, what's your question? On August 25th, <laughs> as you were there that night, did you see Mr. Rosenbaum say that? Yes. Or is that based on video no. after? No, I saw him, oh, I heard him say that. But it's not in your statement? Correct. Uh, there's nothing in your statement about seeing uh, Mr. Rittenhouse walk down to car source. Like little details like that, I'm not an investigator, so I don't know to give those type of details, I'm sorry. So, so this homicide suspect and his actions seconds before the alleged homicide, that's a little detail? Also, remember going back, I didn't, this whole situation got blown out of the water when the ATF got involved. And I was, so many people showing up at my house, showing up at my job. The FBI showed up at my job and asking me questions. So when this statement was given, I gave it to the best recollection of my memory that I could with everything else that was going on around me at, in my life at that time regarding this case. You'd agree watching a homicide suspect walk up to the scene of the first homicide is not a little detail? I was stressed out at the time, I'm sorry. 
Uh, you testified with Mr. Richards that you saw Mr. Gage, uh, Mr. Grosskreutz um, point his gun at Mr. Rittenhouse? Yes. That's nowhere in your statement. Correct. Uh, so that wasn't important to include on September 11th? Like I said, I'm not a detective. But you can tell, you, 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 you gave us things about tipping over a porta potty. Is that more, is that more uh, important than someone pointing a gun at a homicide suspect? No, but it's easier to remember when I captured the photo. And I can reference that photo to, rec to remember th so, that instance. So are these your memories, or are these what you've seen on photos and you've changed your memory or altered your memory because of the photos? It's probably a little of both, but nothing's altered. So you had a camera on you that night? That's how I would have got those photos. And did that take photos and video? It did. So it did. You watched this scene unfold in front of you with people chasing Mr. Rittenhouse? I did. Did you turn your camera on? Yes or no. He said I did. Oh, I did or didn't. I did. I did. I'm sorry. Did you turn your camera on? To take photos? To take anything? Uh, no. Um, I didn't. Uh, if there's a video of, I don't know what, whose video. Excuse well, me. Well, I'm talking about your video. Did you turn your camera on? No. 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 It was a very chaotic situation. Well, you're there to document things, aren't you? And I'm not a professional. So, in your statement, it says nothing about Gage pointing the gun, correct? Correct. In fact, you said, Anthony walked maybe two, three steps and collapsed. That's when I stepped back. I was at the corner house on the southwest corner of Sheridan 61st Street at this time. That's what you said? Correct. I hugged the north wall of the house for cover. Is that correct? Correct. But somehow from hugging the north wall of the house, you saw what happened with Mr. Grosskreutz? That was, by the time I got to the house, everything was done. That's how fast that happened. I didn't even get out of the street. I was still in the street when he was shot, when Grosskreutz was shot. I'm sorry. All you say about the shooting is I saw Gage get shot in the arm and it was a mist of blood. That's all you say about the interaction between Mr. Grosskreutz and Mr. Rittenhouse. Correct. So that was important to say, but nothing else regarding that incident. I, like I said, I'm not a detective. I don't know what you guys look for. I'm sorry that I left that out. This is the first time I ever had to do anything like this. You indicated you saw someone with a loaded pistol. How did you know it was loaded? I watched him load, rack the gun back. Did you know if he had ammunition in it? Um, I know how firearms work. The slide would have stayed back if there was no ammunition in it. Did you watch him load the gun? No. Now, when you are given a statement by a detective, they tell you to put everything in it that's important, right? Through my eyes. You signed the statement that says, this statement is being typed for me by Detective Martin Howard of the Kenosha Police Department and is a true and accurate account of my statement to him. You sign that on the top of each page? Or the top of the first page? I didn't sign nothing at the top of the page, it's at the bottom of the page. All right, so let's go there. So you signed on the bottom, I have made the above statement without any threats or promises. It is my desire to state the true facts as to this incident. I have read the above statement and find that it is true and correct. Correct. And you signed that? Yes, sir. And the statement on top uh, would also indicate that it should be the truth. What statement on top? I don't, I don't understand what you're trying to tell me. On the top of your statement, it says, this statement is being typed for me by Detective Martin Howard. Oh, the on the very first page, if yes. I could, if I could finish my question, please. She has to type everything down so only one person can talk at a time. Thank you. This statement is being typed for me by Detective Martin Howard of the Kenosha Police Department and is a true and accurate account of my statement to him. Correct. Is there anything else you left out of the statement? Mm, not to my knowledge. Do you consider my question to be asking you to change your statement? Not right now. You indicated that Rosenbaum took a chain and kept it for a while, swinging it around. Correct. So you saw Mr. Rosenbaum drop or leave the chain behind. 
I didn't. I don't know when Mr. Rosenbaum separated with that chain. But you said kept it for a while. Correct. So it was gone. At was at some point, yes. Okay. Now, in our meeting, let me ask it this way. Did you see Cal Rittenhouse before the car source lot on that night? Yes. And you described him to us as uh, being notable because he was always out alone on his own. Mr. Rosenbaum? Mr. Rittenhouse. Yes. Okay. So he was, you saw him out on his own doing whatever he was doing by himself? The few times that I, the couple times that I seen him. And when you saw Mr. Rosenbaum, you never saw him actually lay hands on anyone? No. Never saw him hit anyone? No. Never saw him kick anyone? No. Never saw him strike anyone with a chain or any other uh, weapon? No, sir. Never saw him with a gun? No. Now, you indicated in your statement that as Mr. Rittenhouse was being chased back northbound Sheridan Road, you heard someone say, you just shot someone, stop. Is that true? Yes, it is. And you say that Anthony and Gage, meaning Mr. Huber and Mr. Grosskreutz, were yelling at Kyle to stop. Yes. Kyle did not stop and kept going. Correct. Now. In my office, you indicated that you were fearful of an active shooter. I don't recall that. You don't remember saying that um, you thought they were trying to stop an active shooter? No. Do you think they were trying to stop an active shooter? They were trying to stop the, the person that was running. Did you feel? I, I, that time, I, like I said, I don't know. I didn't know what happened at that corner. So you, as a amateur journalist, you were not drawn to go to that location, to Which, the to the 63rd Street car source. Is that the one on the corner? Well, they're all kind of on the corner, but the one, on the, the one on 63rd, the one on 63rd in Sheridan. Um, yes, I was drawn towards that. Okay, but you didn't get there in time to see any of the shooting. No. Now, you indicated that Mr. Rosenbaum said, I just got out of jail and I'm not afraid to go back or something to that level? Yes, sir. Do you know if he got out of jail or not? At the time, I did not know. And you said you saw him have a small plastic water bottle that night? I saw a plastic baggie. Did you, and you told us in our meeting that you saw a plastic bottle in the baggie? Yes. Now, Mr. Rosenbaum, when he made that comment, you didn't see Kyle Rittenhouse around? No. When he was at the 59th Street uh, Ulti Ultimart, and he was saying, uh, what's not in your statement, but you have said, shoot me N-word and having to be restrained. You didn't see Kyle Rittenhouse around. No, I did not. There was many people. <clears throat> you said, I didn't quite hear when you, when Attorney Richards was saying, did you say you had a picture of Mr. Rosenbaum by a cone on fire? Yes. Like a traffic cone? Well, he's in the background just outside the driveway of the gas station. So I'm, I'm just trying to determine what it is. Is it a traffic cone or what is it? Yes. Okay. Construction now, cone, I guess. Construction cone? Yeah. Now, you didn't see Kyle Rittenhouse anywhere 
anywhere around there? Not at that time, no. Uh, I, yeah, and right, I mean, at that time, you did not see Cal Rittenhouse around there. And that didn't threaten anyone's safety relating a traffic code on fire? No. You saw, or you allege you saw Mr. Rosenbaum tip or help tip over a porta potty? I did. It's not alleged. There's a photograph of it. It's ridiculous. Uh, he can phrase his question as he sees fit. Now, you indicated in your statement that, that it smelled terrible. It did. So that was a detail you felt important to include in your statement? Now, when Mr. Rosenbaum tipped over the porta potty, Mr. Rittenhouse was not around. Not that I see. There's no one in the porta potty that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of. So that didn't actually endanger anyone's safety? No. You indicated that there was a trailer that was lit on fire? Yes. Mr. Rittenhouse wasn't around to see that? Not that I. He doesn't know what Mr. Rittenhouse I'll saw or didn't see. I'll rephrase. You did not see Mr. Rittenhouse around then? No. And the trailer was unoccupied? What do you mean unoccupied? I mean there was no one in it. There was what? There was nobody in it. There could be nobody in it. Yeah, it's a flatbed. So that didn't, uh, that didn't uh, endanger anyone's safety? No, unless it tipped over. Now, you said you saw Mr. Rosenbaum arm himself with a chain. He picked up a chain off the ground or off the trailer? Off the trailer. Armed himself is your phraseology? Yes. And uh, did you see Cal Rittenhouse around when he did that? Not that I am aware of. And you never saw him swing it at anyone or threaten or anyone with, the, with that? I saw him just swing it, but it was not directed towards anybody or like any human beings or anything like that. Do you consider handguns or, or chains more dangerous? You, you know, where are we going here, Mr. Turner? I'm not Krause. an expert. Mr. Krause. This witness has spoken a great deal about what he saw Mr. Rosenbaum do, and I am establishing that he did not see Mr. Rittenhouse observe any of it. That isn't what you asked him. You asked him which he considers more dangerous, chains or guns. I'll, I'll withdraw that. Sir, um, you worked for a grocery chain? Yes, I did, yes. You did? Yes. What happened the last couple of weeks? What? You did work for a grocery chain? A while ago, yes. How do you make your living now? I work for a national bottling company. Okay. So your photography is a hobby or you're hoping to, you told me you're hoping to come, become a professional. Eventually, yes. <clears throat> now, you brought your own exhibits in here today. I did. And the defense didn't ask you to do that. You did that on your own. I did. And you know that this case has gotten a great deal of publicity. Yes. And you know there are media outlets here covering the trial? Mm, yeah, uh, apparently there's cameras. And you actually have offered your photographs for sale on that uh, blogger's site who spoke to you. He put those up. So are these photographs for sale? If somebody would want them, but I'm not advertising them. Did you bring your own exhibits because you're trying to uh, enrich yourself with your photography? Not at all. Nothing further. Sir, Can you redirect? Yes. Sir, before the 25th of August 2020, did Kyle Rittenhouse have any significance to you? Before the 25th? Yes. No. Okay. The night of the 25th before the shooting, did you know who Kyle Rittenhouse was? I did not. I didn't even know after taking that graffiti picture okay. earlier you, in the day. Were you looking for Kyle Rittenhouse to know where Kyle Rittenhouse was in relationship to what Mr. Rosenbaum was doing? No, I did not know any of those individuals at that time. And, and when you met with me in my office, there was a private investigator present, correct? Correct. 
and I asked you what you remembered and took notes, correct? Correct. And then I showed you video, correct? Question leading. Correct. Sustained. I was there, and who else? The private investigator and then myself. Okay. And what did we do first? I don't recall. Did I, you come in and did I show you videos right away? Oh, no, no. Um, you introduced yourself. Um, you introduced the uh, private investigator. I don't remember his name. Um, and then you asked, like, if I remembered my police statement. And I said I did because it was just refreshed to me by the district attorney's office. And then you asked if, um, if I, when did I talk to the district attorney's office? And I said just uh, the day prior. And then we started going into my police statement. And after I was done going into your police statement with you, then what did I do? Showed me some videos. Okay. And in the videos I showed you, were you able to identify yourself? Yes. I don't know who recorded the videos, but I can identify myself in a video. And that's, and not just any video, it's right before the shooting. Is that a fair statement? No, Correct. Oral. I don't need to show the video. No, that's all I need. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. What I would consider a brief witness to authenticate a video and say what he saw there. Brief. Right? brief. A magic word. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, thank you. Give this matter be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you guide. I do. You may be seated. Sir, could you please state your name, spelling your last name for the record? Lucas Zanin, Z A N I N. Mr. Zanin, where do you currently reside? The city? Kenosha. Were you present in the city of Kenosha on August 25th of 2020? I was. Directing your attention to approximately 10 before midnight on the 25th, where were you? Uh, I was parked in my car uh, on 63rd Street in the corner of Sheridan Road, across the street from the car lot. Okay. And can you look behind you? See that map? Yes. Can you, if, if this is north and this is south, this here is labeled Sheridan Road and this is 63rd Street, where were you? Do you want me to point out on the map? Yeah, um, I think this is right here. This is gray, yeah, that's it, it's green. Uh, I, I think you have to hold the button down. Yeah. Okay. So, I was approximately right there on the south side of the street. And were you parked driving? What were you doing? I was parked. Okay. And was there, were you driving passenger what? I was a driver. Okay. And was there somebody with you? Yes, my stepdaughter. Okay. And was she filming anything? Yes. So, 
she was leaning out the window of the passenger side and she was videotaping and I was watching uh, events. Were you watching what she was videotaping? Yeah, I was watching what was going on in the parking lot at the time. Okay, and what was exciting or interesting about CarSource at that time? Well, the reason I, I was passing south on, 60, on Sheridan and I took a right on 63rd and then I turned around and parked because as I was going south, I saw fire coming out of the passenger seat of one of the cars. And so I turned around and I decided uh, to park and I saw people smashing the cars with pipes and bats, standing on the hood, kicking the windows in. Okay. You, you can stop a, a second, Mr. Zanin. I'm gonna show you a video and ask you if you recognize it, okay? Exhibit 135, please. Yeah. What is that? That's people kicking and hitting cars with pipes and bats. Okay. Keep going, please. Here, pass the hospital. Go back 10 seconds, please. Go ahead. No, I don't want you to stop. Oh, shit. They shoot him. Whose voice is that? That's my stepdaughter's. Did you hear those gunshots? Yes. Could you describe them for the jury, please? I heard multiple gunshots. Okay. Was there a first gunshot and then a series of gunshots? How did you? Yeah, I, I heard one and then bang, bang, bang. Okay. And after the shots, did the people then start to move? Yeah, they started running. Okay. Before the shots, nothing was disturbing them. They were just bashing in cars. Yes. Now, you or your stepdaughter turned over this tape to Detective Howard, correct? I did, yes. Okay. And you told him what you observed? Yes, I did. And that was back in October 28th of 2020? Direction leading. 
Um, rephrase your question. Do you remember the date you met exactly with the officers? Not exactly. I mean, uh, it seemed like about a year ago they told me that I might be called to be a witness uh, within a year, but they never called me. Okay. Would looking at your statement that you signed tell you the date that you met with the detectives? Well, if it has a date on it, yeah. Mr. Zanin, showing you a two-page document that is not stapled together. Do you recognize this? Yeah. What is this? It's my signature, uh, 28th of October. Okay. And there's a date on it? Yeah. Okay. October 28, 2020. Is that your handwriting? It certainly is. Sir, why are you up here from Texas? Um, actually, I'm a licensed real estate agent in Texas, and I'm a licensed uh, real estate agent in Wisconsin. I was born and raised in Wisconsin. Uh, I had moved to Texas um, to work in the oil fields for a time. Um, my mother passed away, and uh, I came back up here. So my plan has been to sell real estate uh, in Wisconsin in the summer and flip houses and then to go to Texas in the winter and sell real estate uh, and flip houses in Texas. I only ask because at the time you gave it, of your city, you gave a Texas address. Yes, yeah, so I mean, the goal was to be uh, like a lot of Wisconsin people, a snowbird. Snowbird. <laughs> so, so on August uh, 25th, were you? I was, was it here. In Kenosha, yeah. or yeah, my fiance is uh, here in Kenosha. Were you concerned that these individuals would break your car if you're parked right across the street? Um, it, it was well because there was dozens of people in the parking lot, and then there was, I'd say, at least 100 or more behind us. So it, I was frightened. Um, I'm a lifelong, uh, you know, I'm, I was born and raised in Kenosha, and I love my town, and I watched every single night of the riots. And um, the night before. Uh, uh, I'm going to have to stop. You. Okay. Right, let me ask you a question, okay? So. Why did you interrupt? Let him finish. Well, the question is, were you concerned about people behind you? And I thought he was testifying Fair the enough. narrative. Fair You're correct. So why did you, what brought you up past curfew that night? I wanted to, uh, first of all, uh, these were historical events that were happening in my hometown, uh, first of all. Second of all, uh, the night before, uh, rioters had burned dozens of buildings, small businesses. Me being a real estate agent, you know, I have uh, empathy for small business owners. I was very upset that that these rioters were destroying my town, burning my town. So I was hoping if I could see that the night that uh, Kyle was uh, chased and attacked, if I could see somebody set a fire, I could take a video and I, they could be prosecuted by the prosecutors and the police. Now so, you mentioned uh, someone you called Kyle. Did you know Mr. Rittenhouse before that evening? Not at all. Did you know him at all since then, except not through at all. media? Uh, sir, she's got to take on what we say, so it's got to be one at a time, okay? I know it's not how people usually speak, but we just got to be kind of careful about that. <clears throat> so, no, I've never met Kyle. I don't know Kyle Rittenhouse. And you didn't see Kyle Rittenhouse before the shooting, uh, surveying the area or looking at the people <clears throat> breaking windows or anything like that? So you have to understand my, okay. Uh, no, I did not. All right, thank you. Any questions? The cars and the rioters destroying the cars stopped you from seeing Mr. Rittenhouse. Is that a fair statement? I could not see Mr. Rittenhouse. Okay. If Mr. Rittenhouse was in the far corner of the car source lot, was there things blocking your view? All I can say is I did not see the shooting. I just heard it. Okay. And you never saw Mr. Rittenhouse? After the shooting, people scattered, and I could see his face. Okay. And 
You've never spoke to him before or after this event? No. Nothing further. Any questions? No. Thank you. You may step down, sir. Let's break it this time, and uh, I'm going to ask that you return at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, please don't read, watch, or listen to any account of the trial. Don't discuss it with anyone, not even members of your household. And uh, I think the clerk will take care of you in the, in the uh, jury room. Enjoy the evening. Anything else? Okay, see you tomorrow. Okay, well, it's not okay, but. And, um, I'm wondering if we can make arrangements through Zoom under the emergency order of the Supreme Court. The government has no right to confrontation. Obviously, they would have to um, ask questions via Zoom just like we would. Just throwing it out there and the court can think about it tonight. I, I don't have to think about it. I can yeah. tell you my response. If both parties agree and the defendant personally waives, that's fine. Yeah. I don't have an objection. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.